25th place we have a cursed wallet. So this tale begins in October of 1972 when an officer at the United States Military Academy contacted the Warrens a day before they were scheduled to present a lecture to the cadets there, informing them that a curious security problem had arisen and uh, could they possibly help? Now obviously they said yes or else we wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> so the next day at a little past 4 in the afternoon, they entered the gates of the academy and were escorted to the office of Major Donald Wilson. So the Major went on to explain how an unaccountable breach of security was occurring in the home of West Point's commanding general. Ed asked the Major if he knew the nature of the problem, to which the man replied that there was a ghost in the general's quarters. So the Warrens were soon escorted to meet the general and his wife, where they were directed into a sitting room, where the general explained that uh, well nothing macabre had happened, a number of curious incidents had occurred without any kind of explanation. So some background, in the basement of that building there is a private study that at the time was kept locked and secure, but no matter how many times the bunk in there was made up, it was always found ripped apart later. Upstairs, ghosts had been seen flitting about the house. Oh, and personal belongings and other important articles were regularly found missing. The man emphasized not stolen, but just missing temporarily. Later, all these stolen items would be found upstairs, neatly laid out on the dresser in the general's bedroom. So he asked Ed if this could be, you know, caused by a ghost, and Ed confirmed that it was indeed a possibility, and probably like a human ghosty, and not a demonic spirit. Lorraine offered to walk throughout the home to try and, you know, establish where the spirit might be present, while Ed and Major Wilson headed for the basement with the key to the downstairs study. As usual, the bunk was torn apart, as though someone had been sleeping in it. Well, nothing else was disturbed. So while Lorraine did her walk through the house, she picked up impressions of the powerful individuals who had spent time in the home in many, many years over the years, but hardly any sense of a mischievous spirit. Spirit. She offered to enter a trance state later that evening, after the presentation, to attempt to contact the spirit. And the group, you know, was like, all right, you do you, let's try this. So much later that night, after the events of the day, the group made its way upstairs to the MacArthur bedroom. All lights were turned off but one, and Lorraine closed her eyes. She described seeing a black man wearing a dark uniform with no markings, who was overtaken with a sense of fear, guilt, and lack of acceptance. He told her that he'd been accused of killing, and his cell was in the basement, but the army had exonerated him of that crime. He was very sorry, and could not hold his sorrow any longer. He told her that his name was Greer, and you know, spelt it out clearly for Lorraine, and she was able to convince him to pass over into the light. So after she exited her trance, Lorraine gave a complete description of the man and said at the end that he had simply vanished, and mentioned that he had left his wallet in that downstairs bunker. So the general is adamant that based on the uniform Lorraine had described, no black men had served at West Point during that time. But you know, he mentioned he would look into it and thank the Warrens for their time. You know, goodbye, alright. Sure. A few weeks later though, Ed and Lorraine received a phone call from the general. It was discovered that a black man, a porter by the name of, yep, Greer, had served there. So he had been assigned to the Thayer Mansion in the early 19th century, and he had been accused of committing death, but the army did exonerate him of it. His records had been out of order, and he would now be officially filed as deceased. Also, the walls in the bunker had been renovated, and the wallet was finally found. What do you know? The army offered to mail it to the Warrens just to be safe, and it has stayed in their museum ever since. In fourth place, we have the Snedeker family rosary beads. And as you might expect, this true story begins in the witching hour, in the wee small hours of the morning. You know, because if rosary beads aren't scary enough. One night, very late at night, Ed and Lorraine were contacted by this family who had just moved into a house on Meriden Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. And, uh... So originally what they found and you know bought was a big and seemingly welcoming home. But what they didn't know when they bought it was that it was a um, former funeral home. Oh and um, fun fact, the morticians at the funeral home were allegedly involved in necrophilia or you know performing um, sex acts with corpses. And um, oh, what used to be the showroom for the coffins was now um, where the younglings were. And just down the hall from that was the place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. Yeah, not grim at all. So the boys were the first to start talking about things they had seen and experienced, saying they were absolutely terrified, and the parents, you know, like chastised them at first for it, but the boys were so scared they started sleeping on the floor in the living room. Among the sounds they would hear were the sound of chains pulling the coffins upstairs, and um, just, you know, there were no more coffins in the house. So the women who called the Warrens were terrified. With the niece in a small bedroom in the back of the house and the covers on her bed were levitating around her like there was like a fan blowing them around. Lorraine said while the mother was on the phone with her, even more bizarre events started happening. So remember those rosary beads? Yeah, she had them in her hand and while she was speaking, the beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. Lorraine and Ed went over the next morning with the family's parish priest. And a blessing the house seemed to do absolutely nothing to calm things down. And that's when the Warrens decided to call uh, the bishop's office. So the church eventually sent an exorcist, which seemed to like sort of do the trick, but not before one last hurrah from whatever the heck was believed to be haunting the house, because you know, 
demons don't like to give up without a fight. There was this huge tree in front of the house and half the tree with no wind broke off and fell on the property. The family uh, moved the heck out of Dodge a short time later and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart because um, if a demonic spirit can touch a catholic relic that means it's been infested with something absolutely awful and they didn't want to risk the beads spreading throughout the world and causing even more damage. Yeah that makes sense. Number three on this list is the Thirsk Museum. Located in Yorkshire Museum, this tiny little quaint museum is the last place you would expect to see something haunted. Enter in the Busby Stoop Chair. Museum Crush says, Yorkshire drunk, criminal, and coin counterfeiter Thomas Busby murdered his father-in-law and fellow counterfeiter Daniel Autie in 1702. Busby was arrested at the local inn and sentenced to death by hanging. According to legend, he laid a curse on his his favorite chair at the inn, saying death would come soon to anyone who dared sit in his seat. After his execution, his remains were hung in a gibbet from a stoop at Sand Hutton Crossroads, now the location of the Busby Stoop Inn. The inn and surrounding area were said to be haunted by Busby's ghost, but one chair there in particular had developed a rather sinister reputation following a string of tragic accidents. Second World War airmen who sat in the chair were said to never return from their missions, and the chair also linked to several road accidents and fatal illnesses. In 1978, the inn's landlord removed the chair to Thirsk Museum just a few miles down the road. The chair is now suspended high above the ground of the museum to ensure that no unassuming soul can ever fall foul of its curse again. It's been hung there, unmoved, for 40 years. I've looked into this chair further, and for a while there, it really was that if you sat in this thing, you were going to die. It wasn't going to happen in a year from now or something like that either. Like, we're talking about pretty imminent death here. Number two on this list is the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum is one of the most complete museums in the world, and being so complete, it obviously has to include a cursed item. Museum Crush says, This apparently cursed gem was owned by 19th century polymath Edward Heron Allen. So powerful was its curse that he eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Heron Allen also left strict instruction not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. The curious story surrounding the stone says that it was stolen from the temple of the god Indra during the Indian mutiny by Colonel W. Ferris, an officer of the Bengal cavalry. After Ferris's health deteriorated and he died, the cursed amethyst was passed on to to his son, who suffered a similar bout of bad luck and eventually gave it to Heron Allen. After facing a string of health and financial misfortunes, Heron Allen made several attempts to get rid of the stone, but they all proved unsuccessful each time it returned to him. Less than a year after his death, Heron Allen's daughter donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum, where it is on display in the vault. And finally, number one on this list is Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. The number one one voted haunted place in America has got to make this list, considering it's full of cursed objects. There isn't just one object here that's cursed, there are tons. In fact, we would need our own separate video dedicated solely to this place to even begin to break down all the scary stuff that's in this museum. Just listen to this small excerpt from the website. Among the hundreds of terrifying possessions, museum goers can even peek inside the VW death van in which Dr. Jack Kevorkian ended the suffering of terminally ill patients, as well as get a close-up look at the propofol chair from Michael Jackson's death room. Perhaps most unsettling is the original staircase from the Indiana Demon House, notorious for its powerful paranormal activity before being demolished in 2014. The wooden banister and creaky steps from the house now stand in a dimly lit corner, resting on a blanket of dirt from the location. Following its installation, a group of construction workers walked off the job and refused to come back. These are just a couple of the so-called attractions that this place has to offer. If you go to this museum, then there is a very good chance you will end up walking out with a curse attached to you. That much paranormal energy all lumped into one place, it just spells out something haunted. Be very careful if you ever intend to go here. Number five, the family jewels. Some things get passed on generation to generation. Some are begged, some are borrowed, and some are stolen. Our first cursed item has made its way across 
of many seas at the price of many lives. At a whopping 186 carats, the Kohinoor diamond may look precious beyond all belief, but this cursed gemstone has a much darker, unbelievable side too. The name derives from the Persian Hindi words mountain of light. Many theories exist as to its original owner and who was originally cut for. A Hindu description of the diamond warns that quote, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all of its misfortunes. Only God or women can wear it with impunity. Well, that's jarring to say the least. Right there in writing, huh? Yeah. It passed between the hands of various rulers, blood soaked era after another, a king who blinded his own son and a ruler whose head had become encrusted with liquid molten gold was paid for this price. Legend has it that the stone's origins of causing death and misfortune to any male who owns or wears it stems from brothers murdering each other to even sons murdering their fathers over it. But does it actually carry a curse affecting men who wear it? First owned by the emperors of the Mughal Empire in India, it was taken and added with the Timur ruby to make an armband for ruler of the Peacock Empire. The diamond then went to Sikh Maharaja Ranjit Singh. After his death, his five-year-old son Dulip Singh, the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, would be the last male who ever seemed to wear it. Since being owned by the British royal family, and oddly enough, it's only ever been worn by females. Huh. After Queen Victoria's death, Queen Alexandra got it and was used to crown her at her coronation in 1902. The diamond was then transferred to Queen Mary's crown in 1911 and finally to the Queen Mother's crown in 1937, where it remained for more than 80 years. When Queen Elizabeth died in 2002, the crown was placed on top of her casket for the funeral. All of the crowns are now on display in the Jewel House at the Tower of London, with crystal replicas of the diamonds set in the older models they were in. So what's the deal? Is this thing still cursed? Did the royal family know something that we didn't? Maybe. Number four, the statues of Lem. The women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue eventually earned the nickname the goddess of death after four different families experienced tragedy while handling and owning the carved stones. The first owner, Lord Elfont, along with his entire family, perished within six years of owning the statue, all from mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners, Ivor Minucci and Lord Thompson Noel, also died along with their entire family's just a few short years after obtaining the statue within their homes. The fourth owner, Sir Alan Biverbrook, died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the carved rock. Although his sons did not believe in the curse attached to the statue, out of fear of the sudden misfortunes around them, they decided to gift the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh the find, where it is now encased in glass, safe, unable to bear any other family bad news. You gotta think, someone was just like sitting there back then chiseling this rock like 6,000 years ago. What were they thinking? What were they saying out loud? What were they looking at? Why did they seem to have blessed this rock with so much evil and misfortune? You tell me. Number three, the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is a coded book that was believed to have been written at some point in the early 15th century. It was discovered in a locked chest in Rome in the year 1912, and deciphering its history, and more importantly, its meaning, has been the goal of several different scholars for many years before and since. Its first known owner was believed to be Rudolf II. Rudolf apparently thought that the mysterious book had been written by Roger Bacon, and purchased the book for a huge sum of money roughly 600 ducats of gold. The first 100% confirmed owner of the text was an alchemist named George Barish, who found the mysterious book in his personal library, unsure of its origin. It was passed from him to a variety of scholars, emperors, and officials, all of whom failed to decipher its bizarre text and illustrations. Several of the world's best cryptographers from the First and Second World War have tried to decipher its 240 pages and have not found any way to read the book. Some of the pictures include detailed sketches of plants that are not found in nature and zodiac signs. As you might expect, there are several theories about the purpose and author of this book, with some believing that it was a herbology text written in a lost shorthand, and others having more outlandish theories that it was created by aliens from another world. One theory is that the book was written by either a demon or the devil himself, and that anyone who manages to translate its contents will unleash a curse upon the world. A theory they believe is bolstered by the fact that several people who have attempted a translation have gone on to suffer several years of bad fortune. Whether the origin of this book is human or demonic in nature, it is still the most mysterious and curiosity-inducing books in human history. Number two, The Anguished Man. The tale of this rather disturbing-looking painting is strange and steeped in mystery, but every scant piece of information we have on it is more unsettling than the last. The painting of a featureless man 
who seems to be screaming, was apparently painted by a deeply troubled artist who mixed his own blood with his paints in an effort to get the right shade of red. Not long after completing it, the artist took his own life, and the painting found its way into a woman's care. She kept it for many years, but claimed that once she put the painting up, her and her family began to see a dark, shadowy figure roaming about her house. At night, they would hear strange sounds like footsteps and crying. The woman took the painting down and kept it in her attic for 25 years until she died, leaving the painting to its current caretaker, Sean Robinson. Sean had been warned by his grandmother that the painting was haunted, but he thought little of it. Robinson kept the painting in his basement for about a decade before rediscovering it and putting it up. Once again, the family began seeing the dark, shadowy figure roaming the halls and hearing the sound of weeping and moaning during the night. Sean began leaving a camera on by the painting to try and get evidence of its paranormal nature, and upon reviewing the footage, heard some odd noises and saw evidence of doors opening and closing, seemingly by themselves, and the painting falling over onto the ground. As time went on, the activity became more and more intense, with his wife seeing a strange mist and an unseen force pushing his son down the stairs. Things went from bad to worse when guests who came to see the painting began reporting intense and sudden nosebleeds. Sean takes the painting out from time to time to show it to paranormal investigators in television programs who want to hear his story. But otherwise, the anguished man is apparently kept locked away in a safe location to prevent any further harm from coming to unwitting people. Number one, the Bassano Vase. Although it has fallen out of favor now, for centuries, a common gift given to brides on the day of their weddings were intricate ornate vases. Our next tale begins in the 15th century in Italy and spans over 500 years. Legend says that on the day of her wedding, a bride in a village near Napoli found a gift with no clue which of the guests had given it to her. It was a four pound silver vase. She decided to put it in her room for safekeeping before the wedding ceremony. But when the ceremony was due to start, the bride was nowhere to be found. The groom went to her room to look for her and found her lifeless body on the ground with no trace of what had caused the death other than her desperately clutching the silver vase. The bride was buried, and the vase was passed on to one of her family members to be taken care of. Within days, the second member of the family was dead from unknown causes. The vase was given to another member of the family, and when he also passed away, the family made the connection between all the recent tragedies and the Bassano vase. Unsure of what to do, they reached out to a local priest, who upon hearing the story, informed them that whoever had given it to the bride had either cursed it or made it from cursed materials. He advised them to bury it on sacred ground. They dug a hole and wrote a note, warning, beware, this vase brings death, which they placed in the cursed vase. The vase was buried and remained underground for the next 500 years. By horrible chance, a man in 1988 was digging and came across the vase. He read the note, but being the skeptical type, discarded it and took the newly found Bassano vase to a local auction house. The vase went up for auction and was sold for the equivalent of $2,270 to a local pharmacist. Within three months, the pharmacist was dead and the vase was sold by his family to a local doctor who also passed away soon after. The vase developed a reputation after this, and several people who were approached to purchase it refused. But it was eventually bought by an archaeologist, who despite his family's protests, did not believe in curses. He died three months later. His family threw the vase out their window, but a police officer who was passing by saw this and tried to return it. The family refused the vase back and told him of its cursed nature. He tried to give it to multiple different museums, but having heard about the curse, they all refused. Fearing for his life, he did what the bride's family had done over 500 years prior and buried it in a lead box in a cemetery. Which cemetery he used is unknown, but let us hope that no unwitting soul rediscovers this cursed vase and unleashes it upon humanity once again. Number 5. Thomas Busby's Chair Our first entry actually is in a museum, but the curators have deemed it so haunted and dangerous that they have been forced to take special measures to ensure it doesn't unleash its curse on the museum's patrons. The story begins in North Yorkshire in 1702, when two criminals, Daniel Audie, and his son-in-law, Thomas Busby, came into conflict. They were coin forgers who essentially ran a criminal empire, 
but Daniel disapproved of Tom's relationship with his daughter. This resulted in a fight, which ended with Daniel's untimely demise. Thomas was arrested soon afterwards and sentenced to be hung. There is some variation in what happened next. Some versions of the tale say that Thomas was arrested at his favorite pub, and others say he was allowed back into the bar for his last meal before his death. Whatever the case, before being taken away, he told the other patrons of the pub, May sudden death come to anyone who dare sit in my chair. He was then taken away and hung across the street. As the local historian and poet William Grange described it, the bones of the poor wretch who had committed murder were hung to fester in the sunshine and blow in the tempest, until they fell piecemeal to earth, and tradition yet tells tales of night wanderers being terrified when passing this dreaded spot. While Thomas began apparently haunting the spot across from the inn where his remains were displayed, the curse he laid on the chair began taking effect. Over the years, many brave souls sat on the chair to prove that they were not afraid and paid the price. In 1894, a chimney sweep sat in the chair and was found the next day hanging next to where Busby had been displayed. In 1967, two Air Force pilots sat in the chair as a joke, but when they were driving home that night, they crashed into a tree and did not survive. A few years later, a builder sat in the chair and fell off of a roof later that same night. Not long after, a cleaner fell into the chair after slipping while mopping the floor and died of a brain tumor soon afterwards. In 1978, the owner of the now renamed Busby Stoop Inn decided that too many deaths had occurred and donated the chair to the Thirsk Museum. Although they didn't technically lock the chair away, they did hang the chair on a wall, five feet off of the ground, to prevent anyone from sitting on it and receiving Busby's fatal curse. Number four, the Hanging Man painting. This haunted painting is actually linked to a haunted photograph, making it twice as haunted as most objects on this list. It all started when a photographer named James Kidd took a seemingly innocuous photo of a wooden cart next to a barn. Kidd thought nothing of it until he had the photo developed and saw that a ghostly figure had made its way into the frame. On the left side of the cart, he could see a headless and hanging man. He showed the photos to others who searched for any sign of doctoring, but could find none. It was then that this photo caught the attention of a painter named Laura P. Laura claims that she felt drawn to the image and decided that she had to make an oil painting based on the photograph. While painting the picture, she reported feeling deeply uneasy, but pushed through to finish her art. The painting was hung at a local business, but was soon taken down after it reportedly began moving on its own and caused several important papers to go missing. Laura then put the painting up in her own home, but soon began to experience strange occurrences. These included objects being knocked over or broken, mysterious knocking on the doors, strange leaks, and perhaps most disturbing, the apparition of the headless man in her home. Once word of the haunted painting got out, she received several offers from collectors to buy the painting, but she has so far refused, claiming that she is afraid of what the painting could do in the homes of others. In third place, we have a long black spike. So what appears to the innocent eye is like nothing but like a fence stake, perhaps left over from a construction project of sorts, actually holds a history of sadness and evil doing. Being the oldest item listed today, its history dates back to its use in like the 1700s. While the name of the witch it belonged to has been lost to time, the spike was originally used in a black mass ritual in an attempt to summon Satan himself to this world. The witch we're speaking of had attempted to curse the stake over the course of her pregnancy, hoping that it would become strong enough to take the soul of her um, womb in exchange for the devil. During the ritual, she plunged the stake into the flesh as sacrifice, but uh, while it strengthened her relationship with Satan, it did not succeed in bringing him to earth. The stake was passed down as a family heirloom, bringing a feeling of longing and sadness to any that held it until it was uh, finally acquired by the Warrens. Knowing that the museum is technically closed, I worry if any vandals break in, the damage they could do with something that looks so unassuming, but it's so dangerous. In second place, we have the Carlson's Knickknacks. So, this happily married couple in their 30s bought this old inn in New England. No big. So, Nathan Carlson traveled a lot during the week, but his wife, Alexandra, was home all the time to take care of their two daughters. Not long after moving in, Mrs. Carlson and her daughter began hearing footsteps on the second floor where, you know, in the past, lodgers used to stay. During the afternoon and late into the night, they'd hear dragging, heavy booted footsteps move across the floor above them. Mrs. Carlson's older sister, who lived nearby, occasionally stayed overnight in the house and also heard these footsteps. The Carlsons had rooms set aside elsewhere in the house for, you know, like live and farm help, and these men would hear the footsteps walking in circles around their bed. 
Sometimes, while Mrs. Carlson would be asleep at night, she'd be awakened by the spirits in the home, which would actually gank the covers off the bed while she was, you know, in it. She later found out that very same thing happened to the farm help, which uh, explained why the men tended to, you know, quit so soon after they were hired. Eventually, the infestation phenomena upgraded into whisperings that could be heard behind closed doors. However, when Mrs. Carlson or her older sister checked the room where the whisperings were coming from, there was never anyone present. Although these spirits projected words that were often audible enough to be heard, the woman could never quite identify the language that was being used. And as time went on, the uh, harassment continued. After the missus would straighten up the house, knickknacks and other little items would never be quite where she left them. Outside the house at night, lights would be seen in the attic, although there was no electricity up there. While painting a room one day, the heat was suddenly drawn away, and Mrs. Carlson felt a hand touch her shoulder. She said she became so angry that she threw the paintbrush in the direction where she believed the entity to be, and told it out loud, I don't know who you are or what you want, but you're not gonna get me. Oh yeah, real smart. So this phenomenon went on almost daily, since this infestation had occurred in the house a long, long time ago. Exact date unknown. Both the kitchen and the bathroom water faucets would suddenly turn themselves on, full force at the same time. And on occasion, Mrs. Carlson would hear three knocks at the front door, which, um, that's a sign of an inhuman presence. But whenever she'd go to the door, there would be nobody there. On the second floor, a visitor reported seeing a snake on the window ledge after hearing three taps on the window, yet there was no nearby tree the reptile could have climbed. Yeah, say, snakes, nope. Oh, it gets worse. Ah, well, living in the house, the Carlsons had another spawn. And one night, while the missus was watching television in the living room, she suddenly heard a tremendous, powerful explosion. When she jumped up to check, thinking out know, the furnace had <laughs> kaboomed, she found the door to the infant's room violently torn open. Objects were still swinging and vibrating, and the temperature in the nursery was equal to a meat locker. Although the spirits in the home had evidently tried to kill uh, the youngling, the little one managed to live through the experience. Thank goodness. However, when the spawn reached three years of age, Mrs. Carlson was walking past him as he played with some knickknacks in the living room when he suddenly let go with a loud shriek saying, You stepped on Beatrice! So Mrs. Carlson put down the laundry she'd been carrying and asked, Who? To which he responded that Beatrice was his friend who told him what to do. Mrs. Carlson then told her son to ask Beatrice who she was, and after a pause, he replied that Beatrice had told him to tell her that um, she's a witch. So the mom took away the items the boy was playing with and almost sent him into hysterics in the process. She tossed him into a basket in her bedroom closet, you know, somewhere the boy was forbidden to go without her permission, and didn't really think about it, until later that night, when she was in bed by herself and saw a large black form in the room with her. She described the entity as being, you know, blacker than the blackest night, moving slowly around the room, freezing her with fright. I swear I'm not a poet. <laughs> Before the black mask went away, it transmuted into a globe of synthetic light about the size of a basketball, well, producing a deafening roar, which she compared to a blasted furnace. This went on for many nights until the warrants were called in, and like many other times I've mentioned today, took a tour of the home, blessed it, and realized uh, the knickknacks were directly tied to the entity. Now, they've never described them in detail, so I don't have any clear photos to discuss today, but I'm assuming they're around the size of action figures if a three-year-old was able to play with them. In first place, we have Bathsheba's jewelry box. So this is probably the most famous case on today's list. In January of 1971, the Perron family moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, where Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters began to notice strange occurrences almost immediately. So this started with events that most of us probably wouldn't even register. Carolyn would notice that the broom went missing or seemed to move from place to place on its own, and the young girls of the home began to notice spirits around the house. Carolyn then brought it upon herself to research the history of the home and discovered that it had been in the same family for eight generations, and that many of them had passed under mysterious or horrible circumstances. The most haunting spirit of the home is that of which Bathsheba Sherman. Being fairly well off, Bathsheba and her husband Judson had a son, Herbert, born when Bathsheba was about 37 years old. And while the couple gave birth to three others, they were unable to survive past the age of seven. One of the passings of a neighbor's ward in her care drew public attention during a post-mortem examination, when it was determined that the fatal wound was caused by a large sewing needle that had been impaled at the base of the skull. It's believed Bathsheba took offense to Carolyn moving into what she considered her home and uh, wanted to take back that control. So the most notable incident overall was one afternoon when Carolyn said that she had been lying on the sofa and out of nowhere felt a piercing type of pain in her calf and then the muscle began to spasm. And upon examination, she noticed a puddle of uh, redness at the point of impact. She checked her bees or anything else that could have like caused the puncture in her leg but found nothing. In her daughter's book, Andrea Perron describes the wound as perfectly circular, as if uh, a large sewing needle had impaled her skin. Now, if I were to summarize the entire hell the Perron family endured for the decade they lived in what they referred to as the old Arnold estate, we'd be here for an hour. But during one of the last instances, the Warrens were called in to help the ailing family, and uh, they removed a box from the home after thoroughly blessing it, believing that it was acting as a conduit for Bathsheba's demonic energy to affect the home, this being the jewelry box. Upon entering the Warrens Museum, one of the first things you'll see is this frightening little shadow doll, made of bird feathers and real human teeth. 
The Warren's son-in-law and current proprietor of the museum, Tony Spera, offers a bit of insight on the doll, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold and the owners of the shop, being none the wiser of the doll's evil, had it for sale. That's totally on the antique shop owners though. You come into possession of a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth, your first instinct should be to bury it with some rosaries, not stick a price tag on it, but I digress. The doll's curse works by taking a photograph of the doll, and when it develops, writing the curse you'd like to inflict and sending it to your victim. The person who then opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photograph will invite the curse into your home. The real question I have about the shadow doll is do you think it is jealous that it's not the most famous haunted doll in the Warrens collection? I know I'd probably have a hard time sitting next to Annabelle all day while everyone comes to gawk at my movie star sister. No wonder the doll is cursing people. If you're having fun, drop a subscribe and catch new scary videos every single day. Number 4. The Brick from Borley Rectory A brick? Okay, you're running out of ideas and it's only number 4. Well, bear with me, okay? It's not just the brick, it's the story behind the brick. And besides, a, a brick is actually pretty scary on its own, it doesn't even need to be haunted. Just imagine it being thrown, thrown into a window, bam, very scary. Anyway, this particular cursed brick comes to us from Borley Rectory, one of the most haunted houses in the United Kingdom and I gotta say possibly one of the worst named buildings in the country. Borley Rectory sounds like a horrible medical infection. Borley Rectory could be its own video based on all the alleged hauntings and stories that have taken place in its hallowed walls. Since the 18th century, it's been home to all sorts of reported hauntings. It checks off all the usual requirements for a haunted domicile. To name a few, unexplained footsteps, ghostly apparitions, bells ringing without reason, whispers of a headless monk that would wander the halls, horse-drawn carriages being commandeered by a headless horseman, seeing shadows, and one ghastly nun who just may be served as the inspiration for the nun from the film The Nun. There is a lot going on at this haunted building. So naturally, it's a great spot for two famed demonologists. And sometime in the 1970s, Ed and Lorraine Warren ventured out to the UK to investigate the Borley Rectory and see if maybe they could put a plug in some of this. Upon entering, Lorraine declared almost immediately that she could feel the presence of a nun's spirit. So the pair took some photographs and after developing the photographs, lo and behold was the ghostly apparition of a nun in the corner. Now obviously the story of the film is much different and in the film The Nun, the Warrens only really appear for a Thanos style cameo at the end, but you never know, this could very well have been the inspiration for that character. The brick serves as a souvenir and a remainder of one more haunting in their storied logbook. Number three, the mummy. Not actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin or lid. The board is painted of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. Time scale for you, that's about a thousand years BCE. The British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mummy was found at Thebes in Greece in the late 1800s and tales of its curse started soon after its discovery. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in a shooting accident and two died of health problems. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the lid. One of the most infamous rumors about the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic. Wait a minute, what? One of the victims on board was a journalist who apparently was the first to publish articles about the mummy's find and the curse that went with it. Survivors from the disaster recall hearing stories about the ship of an ominous artifact that has a sinister reputation. As the mummy's stories and the rumors spread, people who survived began to ask the question if the rumors had caused the disaster that night. The the unlucky mummy is now an ancient Egyptian artifact in the collection of the British Museum in London. The identity of the original owner is still being studied and the related causes brought on by it. Due to the brief hieroglyphic inscriptions of short religious phrases, scientists are still trying to decipher the name and the curse that comes along with it, and the actual location of where the body disappeared to. It's been feared since the discovery in the late 1880s, and the mummy's lid has acquired a reputation credited with causing death, injury, and large scale disasters, earning the nickname the unlucky mummy. None of these stories have any basis in fact, of course, but the mummy serves as a spiritual question mark and remains a mystery to scientists who crack the code open. Yo, where's Brendan Fraser when you need him, right? He can figure this whole thing out. Number two, the haunted bed. Apparently there's a bed that makes you more dizzy and have more sinister evil visions than that of a night on a waterbed. Yeah, I've had a couple hungover nights lost at sea, let me tell you. Gets pretty choppy out there. Highly don't recommend it. But this bed, 
I also highly don't recommend. The lavishly ornate Great Bed of Ware does not like you sleeping in it. The hardwood oak bed is richly decorated and carved with figures and scenes you could daydream for, well, days over. It's so large that it's rumored to comfortably sleep four couples. Yeah. Talk about a California king. There is a tale that suggests that the bed was made in the 15th century for King Edward IV by a very gifted carpenter, but through the years found itself being passed between the inns of Ware where commoners were able to sleep in it, break the legs, and apparently cover it head to toe in graffiti. Yeah, the disrespect alone. The defacing got so bad that apparently the ghost of the maker haunts those who are not of royal blood. Basically not blessed by God to rule. It's so old and so haunted that apparently people who spend the night are woken up violently by spectacles watching them sleep. Apparently there are so many initials carved into the wood, images drawn on it, that it's hard to know who actually the bed was originally fitted for, and who actually cursed it. Some researchers believe that the curse surrounding the bed could have actually been carved into it with symbols and text that hexed the next user. Whatever its history, it's haunted haunted. The bed can now be found in the British galleries of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. We need like the Long Island medium to take a nap in it, you know what I mean? See what she thinks. And coming in at the number one spot, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army was discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers. Yang Zifa, his five brothers and neighbor were digging a well east of the Quin Emperor's tomb mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, occasional reports mentioned pieces of terracotta figures and fragments of the Quin necropolis. Roofing tiles, bricks, and masonry were regularly found. But when they discovered heads, Chinese archeologists started to investigate. To this day, it remains the largest pottery figure group ever found. The Terracotta Army seemed to be a collection of terracotta sculptures depicting the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. It is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting the emperor in the afterlife. The figures were discovered in Lingtong County outside Shaanxi, China. The figures vary in height according to their rules and they're all dressed in different garbs, the tallest of course being the generals. These statues include warriors, chariots equipped with horses, Horses, more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Other terracotta non-military figures were found in pits close by, including officials, acrobats, strongmen, and musicians. Yo, are we sure that Medusa didn't just like make her way through China and start stoning people in time with her looks? Because that's like an entire city made out of clay. In the records of the Grand Historian, China's 24 dynastic histories, it was written that work on the mausoleum began in 246 BCE soon after Emperor Quinn ascended the throne. Apparently the project involved 700,000 workers. Yeah, I'd really hope so, because that many perfectly sculpted figures are so realistic, there must have been a city of artists. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. This is scary just looking at it. I'm not convinced this was just an art project for the journey between spirit realms. I think this was used as a decoy for battle. 20,000 figurines just chilling, waiting? Seems pretty intimidating to me. Whatever its origins, it's jarring to look at. What do you think? Number five on this list is the smelly photo. All right, everybody, beware of the smelly photo, for if you purchase it, then you'll be cursed with a horrible smelling odor for all of eternity. All right, so maybe it's not that dramatic, but apparently this is actually a thing. Mental Floss says this historic daguerreotype type is reportedly inhabited by a Victorian gent named Martin. It was initially found in the eaves of of an attic and its owner would bring it out for guests to see. Eventually people began to notice that certain smells would mysteriously appear and just as mysteriously disappear such as the scent of roses and cigar or pipe smoke or even the odor of smoke from a wood fire the seller writes. When questioned with a Ouija board the spirit inside was sometimes talkative and even playful but other times reticent. But some spooky things started happening in the house, like objects disappearing or being moved, and footsteps and whispers faintly heard. These strange goings on became more frequent until finally the image was removed from the house and sent to a collector who reports some continued activity. So I'm unsure if you can still buy this thing or if it's completely off the market for good, but realistically you probably shouldn't want to be buying it anyways. Your house basically becomes immediately haunted with weird smells if you purchase this photo. Now I will admit some of these smells really aren't that bad, like roses. If this picture can just make my house smell like roses all the time, then I mean that sounds pretty nice. Or honestly cigar smoke can be really nice too. Like. 
there's definitely a time and place to have a good whiff of a cigar, but the big problem is that you can't really control this thing. So if my guy wanted to just scent the house up with the odor of unwashed 1800s Victorian era man, then he could totally do that. This item isn't gonna kill you or anything, but I do think that the novelty would wear off pretty fast and it could get annoying very quickly. Just make sure that you have some Febreze on hand if you do choose to buy it. Number four on this list is the Haunted Donkey. So this one could be very good or very bad depending on the person who purchases it. Mental Floss says this small decorative juice container has a surprisingly spooky backstory. According to the owner, it spontaneously fills up with water. The inherited piece has been exhibiting the odd behavior for years since the owner was a child. At first, they suspected that their grandmother who owned the item at the time was filling it with water, but once she died, they discovered that there was something else at play. One night, the seller knocked against the jug by accident and noticed it sounded like it had liquid in it. When I investigated, I found that there was indeed water in it, they wrote. I thought maybe it was a mistake, they explained, but it's happened sporadically ever since. I'm not scared or anything, but I'm just not into the type of stuff. I wish my Nana well in the afterlife, but it's just not for me, they said. Now one thing that isn't mentioned there is what happens if you drink the water. Apparently if you have a good heart and are kind and caring and look out for your fellow human, then drinking this water is fine and it's believed to even give you good luck. But if you don't possess those qualities that I just listed, if you're rude, if you're selfish, and if you're greedy, if you only look out for yourself and will walk over other individuals for your own personal gain, then drinking this water will do the opposite. You will be cursed with bad luck and it will be very hard to get rid of it. So that's what I mean. This item can be very polarizing and can be super good depending on who buys it or it could be super bad. Number three, the satanic idol and the human skull. No way. No way a satanic idol and a human skull are haunted. No way. The skull was given to the Warrens apparently as a gift and I sincerely hope they kept the gift receipts for that one because it's not the kind of thing I'd like but they probably loved it. Now the satanic idol is a slightly different story. The tall, slender, bizarre idol doesn't immediately scream satan or satanic but all you need to do is take a single look at it to be unnerved. It's definitely not the kind of thing you'd ever want to be face to face with or I don't know, see in a scary clearing in the woods. And yet for one lonesome hunter, that's exactly what happened. Apparently, the idol and the skull with it were taken from the woods nearby the Warren estate by a local hunter who had found them both. The hunter claims that he was approached by a man in mysterious black garb who ushered him away. Obviously, a little shaken and stirred by such a bizarre experience, went to the only people he thought he could trust with something like this, and he took the idol to the Warrens for safekeeping. Now, after he brought it to them, Lorraine Warren fell deeply ill almost immediately after bringing the idol into their home with no one able to correctly diagnose what was happening to her. Ed believed that his family was being targeted for welcoming the idol into their home. You'd think that a pair of story demonologists like this would have seen this coming, but you know, we all make mistakes. Lorraine recovered, obviously, and although no details emerged on how she did or, or what they did to purify and cleanse the idol, we can assume most likely it was probably blessed, exercised, and doused in holy water of some kind, Otherwise, it wouldn't be fit to sit amongst their treasures. It now rests inside the museum, alongside all their other haunted relics, patiently waiting for Hollywood, where I've heard it's very open to hearing offers for a three-picture deal and some spin-offs if that's on the table. Number two, the organ. Now, one of the more mysterious items inside the museum is this big grand organ. Get your mind out of the gutter. It's a musical instrument, like a church organ. The church organ was recovered after authorities seized a haunted house in Connecticut. Having close ties to the Warrens, the authorities asked if there was anything they might like to retrieve from the site. The house burned down mysteriously, not even days after the organ was removed. Ed Warren, lover of all things haunted and a good bargain, had a great interest in this organ and keeping of his self-imposed duty of controlling haunted objects, took it upon himself to take it home. And obviously this thing was cursed, obviously. Ed Warren would say that he would hear songs being played from it discordantly throughout his home whenever no one was around. And when Ed would venture forth into his office to investigate it, the music would stop as soon as he opened the door. He says this would occur every time he tried to investigate it, happening three different times. Eventually, losing sleep over one more haunted relic, 
Ed Warren contacted a friend at the clergy to come bless it. He would have a priest come by every two weeks or so to bless his home and to bless every item in the museum to keep the spirits docile. It begs the question, with this much effort why even keep cursed items in your home? The organ at least seems benevolent, but Annabelle, the skulls, the satanic idols, why them? Well, Ed and Lorraine believed by keeping these items under supervision, it meant they were safe from outside interference and no one else would be put at risk. The pair feared that if any of the cursed objects were destroyed or damaged, then they could release the spirits back into the world, free to cause more mayhem. The same reason is why, despite the passing of the Warrens, the museum is still kept up and open and maintained. And also so, you know, paranormal ghouls and goblins like us can go check out all this spooky stuff and get some fantastic Instagram stories out of it. Number 1. The Conjuring Mirror Hey, wait a second, there wasn't a particularly notable mirror in The Conjuring, are you trying to fool me? It was a haunted music box. Well, you're totally right. It was. It was a haunted music box. This is a different thing unrelated to The Conjuring, but related to The Conjuring in the sense that it was owned by Ed and Lorraine. Give it enough time, this might be in one of the movies. Over the years, you've probably heard all sorts of superstitions regarding mirrors. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that breaking one is seven years of bad luck. But there are some who say that mirrors can be used as portals to other worlds and can be used as the stage for all manner of ritual. It's even been said this is how Nostradamus was able to peer so deep into the future. This desire caught the attention of one Stephen Zellner, a Connecticut native who wanted to try a little soothsaying of his own. He acquired the mirror and performed a ritual on the art of claptromancy, dangling the mirror from a thread into a pool of water, where supposedly, if performed correctly, you'll be able to see visions in the reflections below. Well, as the story goes, for Zellner, it worked. And he saw brief glimpses of his future, but didn't see the spirits that had been kept inside the mirror which he invited into his home, wreaking all manner of havoc on him. Doors would slam shut, drawers would fly open, objects would be hurled across the room, the poltergeist classics. Knowing that he'd invited something dark that he couldn't handle into his home, he reached out to the church for an exorcism and was referred to Ed and Lorraine. The pair exorcised the spirits back into the mirror, sealing them back. Knowing that it wasn't safe to leave the mirror in the hands of Zellner, the two offered to take it off of his hands, protecting and controlling the evil inside and adding it to their collection of delightful cursed relics where it now resides. Number 5. The Pearls of Death We know the Warrens. If that name doesn't sound familiar, check out some of the other vids and who they were on this channel. They were a pretty spooky duo. They've seen some nightmarish stuff in their time, and still have some proof of the evil that they vanquished. Their son-in-law still runs the official occult museum website and museum out of Monroe, Connecticut. Now, if you've seen Annabelle Comes Home, this first item on the list should ring a bell. The character Daniela in the movie tries to communicate to a loved one beyond the grave. Never a good idea. Unless you're with the Long Island medium, you know? Stick with the professionals. In order to do that, however, she puts on the museum's mourning bracelet. Yeah, that's not really a good idea there, Daniela. Now, there isn't really a mourning bracelet in the real occult museum, but there is such a thing as the Pearls of Death. And as of now, the Pearls of Death still have yet to appear in the Conjuring franchise. But they're notoriously one of the most dangerous items in the Worms Museum, says their son-in-law, and very, very real. Beautiful accessory, I should add, but a very haunted and spirited set of pearls. They were added to the museum after a woman claimed that they were constantly strangling her. The Pearls of Death are said to strangle those who wear them. Now, I know what you're thinking. Get a bigger size, right? Right? Well, it wasn't the wrong fit, per se, but like, choked, choked, aggressively. The story goes, the second that this poor woman put on these pearls, she literally needed people around her to even yank the pearls from its death grip around her neck. Yo, that is terrifying. Sometimes when I sleep with my chain on, I feel like I'm in a triangle choke in the UFC. But thankfully for us, the curls currently rest on the Warren shelves, where they'll hopefully stay for the foreseeable future. Tony Spera, the son-in-law of the Warrens and current owner-operator says, it all goes way back with the cursed objects. Objects that someone put a curse onto, it could be a bracelet, a necklace, or any article that someone performed incantations and rituals over to put bad energy into, as someone or something famously did to the Annabelle doll. I feel like just talking about her, she's going to show up. In the same way a priest can bless a holy relic, a satanic worshiper or black magic practitioner can curse a belonging, as seen with the pearls of death. Number four, the werewolf paw. As always, if you dig what we do here on Top 5 Scary, hit that like button or feel free to leave us a comment down below. Let us know which James Wan Warren story is your favorite. I mean, nothing beats the David's exorcism scene in The Conjuring 3. Yeah, spoiler alert, it's uh, uncomfortable to watch. 
Some of you will get it. Scariest thing I've ever seen in my life, I swear to God. However, in Annabelle Comes Home, we see another terrifying object just chilling on the shelf. A werewolf claw. Later in the movie, we even see a real werewolf demon thing outside the Warren's house. And of course, according to Tony Spera, the werewolf paw is a nod to the real 1980s werewolf case that took the Warrens all the way to London, England. A true story of demonic possession. And not just normal demonic possession. That's a weird sentence to say out loud. But we know about this case. Apparently, they watched a television program, Sightings, and police officers and locals got interviewed about their encounters with a real local werewolf, the infamous Bill Ramsey. They said his abilities to take on men twice his size with ease as he would rampage through the city blacking out. Lorraine felt a connection to him and after traveling to London, she found Bill. According to Lorraine, he was possessed by an evil wolf spirit and needed a full-blown exorcism. The exorcism was a success on American soil and Bill was able to return home ready to start the rest of his non-lycanthropic days. He wouldn't grow hair or change at a full moon, but he used his fingers like claws, attack people, and even would run around on all fours. Could this wolf paw in the museum be responsible for the werewolf case in London? I think it might. Number three on this list is the Tai Jin mask. We have another cursed item from eBay here that can certainly have its benefits, but also have its drawbacks as well, if you aren't careful with it. Mental Flaw says, the person selling this mask claims that they personally witnessed a witch in Thailand capture a Jin or genie in it. Among the mask's alleged talents are the ability to bring the owner riches and the ability to keep vampires away. Both are useful skills. Skills, but they come with a price. You must make offerings of food and drink to keep the jinn happy. Not to mention the fact that for the first month you have to meditate on his name three times a day for 20 minutes each. So here's my thing. Riches and the ability to ward off vampires, that sounds cool, I like it. I mean, who wouldn't want to have a magical mask that can make you rich, that'd be awesome. Granted, there is that whole other thing too. This is a Jin, and even though that's really cool, I don't want to fall into a trap of fully trusting this thing. Genies are very tricky. They say one thing, you take it at face value, but they mean something else entirely. So this thing might say something and make you believe that you're getting rich, and then totally flip the script on you and have it mean something else. Also, let's not forget that if you mess up a little bit and don't offer this thing food or water or meditate on it three times a day, then it will probably choose to respond decently badly to you. These are all risks that I personally don't think I'm willing to take. Also, here's my other thing. Like, if this mask is gonna give you tons of riches, then why is somebody selling it on eBay? Why would you need to sell this thing if you're already super rich based on the mask? And if it was that great, then wouldn't you wanna keep it? I don't know, just some stuff to consider before you pull the trigger on this thing. Number two on this list is Lisa's shoes. Lisa was a young girl who lived back in the Victorian era a long time ago. Now apparently she died way too soon. We think it was sepsis, but we don't really know when she died or why she died for sure. All we know is that she was taken from the earth way too early. Mental Floss says, said to contain the spirit of a little girl called Lisa, these shoes were found by someone who was curating their late aunt's estate, tucked in a nursery closet alongside various Victorian clothes and toys. They suspected they were haunted, the seller writes, since there was a lot of knocking in the nursery closet. If actually possessed, tap dancing might wake one up in the middle of the night. The noise wasn't the only indication of the shoe's otherworldly nature. The house they were were found and was rumored to be home to a number of ghosts, including that of a woman who had murdered her baby there in the 19th century and the spirit of a nine-year-old girl who died of sepsis. So if you're the type of individual who likes to fall asleep to the sound of cursed shoes dancing all over the floor, then I guess this is for you. I don't know how many of those people are out there, but hey, no judgment here. I personally do not have any interest in purchasing some cursed shoes, but that's just me. Apparently, if your heart really does desire such a thing, then a few clicks on eBay is all it's gonna take. And finally, number one on this list is the Anguished Man painting. The Anguished Man painting has been something that we've talked a decent amount out a bit on this channel when it comes to haunted and cursed paintings. Well, you can buy this haunted slash cursed painting on eBay if you wanted to do so. The seller of this oil painting describes it as a horrific paranormal portrait. The artist is unknown, but according to its 
owner, the artwork may be responsible for a number of spooky goings on around the house. Since owning this painting, I've experienced a number of strange paranormal events that cannot be easily explained at the seller writes in the listing. These include hearing disembodied footsteps from elsewhere in the house, the sound of bird songs appearing out of thin air in the living room, and finally observing a heavy metal door latch lift by itself and the kitchen door open by itself. So that's a hard pass from me guys. Not only will this painting curse you and your home, but also like really isn't that great of a painting to begin with. I mean, I don't want to disrespect the artist here. I'm sure that they had a great vision, but I don't really want to have a picture of a screaming dude in my home just looking at me all the time. Even if this thing wasn't haunted and was just totally normal, that would still scare the bejesus out of me late at night when I'm half asleep going to get a glass of water or something. If you are about it though, then hit them up on eBay and you can get the Anguished Man painting in your home today. Number 5. The Anguished Man The tale of this rather disturbing looking painting is strange and steeped in mystery, but every scant piece of information we have on it is more unsettling than the last. The painting of a featureless man who seems to be screaming was apparently painted by a deeply troubled artist who mixed his own blood with his paints in an effort to get the right shade of red. Not long after completing it, the artist took his own life, and the painting found its way into a woman's care. She kept it for many years, but claimed that once she put the painting up, her and her family began to see a dark, shadowy figure roaming about their house. At night, they would hear strange sounds like footsteps and crying. The woman took the painting down and kept it locked in her attic for 25 years until she died leaving the painting to its current caretaker. Sean Robinson. Sean had been warned by his grandmother that the painting was haunted, but he thought little of it. Robinson kept the painting in his basement for about a decade, before rediscovering it and putting it up. Once again, the family began seeing the dark, shadowy figure roaming the halls and hearing the sound of weeping and moaning during the night. Sean began leaving a camera on by the painting to try and get evidence of its paranormal nature, and upon reviewing the footage, heard some odd noises and saw evidence of doors opening and closing seemingly by themselves, and the painting falling over onto the ground. As time went on, the activity became more and more intense, with his wife seeing a strange mist and an unseen force pushing his son down the stairs. Things went from bad to worse when guests who came to see the painting began reporting intense and sudden nosebleeds. Sean takes the painting out from time to time to show it to paranormal investigators and television programs who want to hear his story but otherwise, the anguished man is apparently kept locked away in a safe location to prevent any further harm from coming to unwitting people. Number 4. Robert the Evil Doll We've all heard of the cursed Annabelle doll that has permeated pop culture for the last decade, but have you heard of Robert? Robert was a gift to a young boy of the same name, Robert Eugene Otto, from his grandfather. The grandfather had been traveling in Germany and came across the doll who was not intended to be a toy, but a window display. He bought the doll for his grandson, who dressed it in a sailor's outfit that he had outgrown and kept it with him at almost all times. As the young boy grew up, witnesses remember his relationship with the doll seemed to grow more and more unhealthy, with him referring to the doll as a living person and blaming mishaps on him. The boy, who went by his middle name, Jean, grew up to be an eccentric artist in a stately home known as the Artist's House. He kept Robert by the upstairs window, where children claimed to see him moving in and out of view. When Jean died in 1974, the new owner of the house, Myrtle Reuter, found the doll and became its new owner. Visitors of the house began reporting the sound of giggling and footsteps coming from the attic where the doll was being kept. When the doll was around people who spoke ill of its original owner, some claim that his facial expression seemed to change. After Myrtle got sick of the doll apparently moving around the home by itself and scaring guests for 20 years, she chose to donate Robert to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida. Robert now resides in a locked display case to prevent the over 120 year old doll from decaying further, but also to protect the visitors of the museum, but even those precautions don't seem to always work. Guests who insult Robert at the museum report experiencing tragedies in their lives not long after. This has ranged from people losing their jobs, getting divorced, breaking bones, getting into automobile accidents, and even a few 
deaths. The doll reportedly receives letters every day from admirers, people wanting the doll to curse their enemies, and a few from people asking Robert to reverse the curse they believe he has laid upon them. Number 3. The Cursed Brick Perhaps one of the least terrifying items on this list is a brick from the Borley Rectory. AKA a brick from one of the most haunted houses in all of England. The house was originally built back in 1862. It was a house built for the rector of Borley. But after a fire in 1939, it was never rebuilt. It was finally demolished after in 1944, but before its final days, Harry Price, a paranormal researcher at the time, reported numerous ghostly sightings, including a ghost nun, a ghost car passing by, as well as numerous horse and buggy sounds on the property. Uh, that's terrifying. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. A little piece of the haunted home sits in the Warren Occult Museum today as they were able to visit the Borley Rectory before it was demolished. According to local folklore, a nun fell in love with a monk from the monastery and the pair attempted to elope together. They were found and sentenced to death. The monk was reported to have been sent to the gallows in the monastery whilst the nun was sealed into the walls of the nunnery alive. Ouch. This nun is believed to be the one that is seen on the grounds of the Borley Rectory endlessly looking for the monk that she once loved. That's kind of cute. That's kind of nice. The nun has been seen and heard many times over the years, and the first reports came from 1928 when the owner Guy Eric Smith and his wife contacted a newspaper to report a strange happenings. The newspaper took on the help of an investigator, Mr. Harry Price. Mr. Price stayed at the house to research for more than a year. While staying there, Price witnessed a ton of poltergeist phenomena. Even said that he got in touch with the spirit of a past tenant, Reverend Harry Bull, who died in the house. After numerous attempts at exercising the property, in 1930, Mr. and Mrs. Smith left the house for good. The next residents of the house were Reverend Foister and his wife Marianne. They both experienced the same phenomena that Price and the Smiths had witnessed before them. However, this time the poltergeist activity seemed to be a little bit more aggressive with reports of smashed glasses, broken windows, and Marianne being even thrown from her bed in the middle of the night. In 1939, the house was burnt to the ground due to an oil lamp. It was then left to ruins until 1944 when it was demolished, demolished. The Borley Rectory was said to have been the most haunted building in all of the UK. So although just an unassuming brick, its origin story has seen quite a bit of life and death. Number two, black magic dolls. We already know some of the infamous museum dolls that are haunted by all hell, but we're not talking about Annabelle. There are apparently handfuls of other dolls that deserve some jarring honorable mentions. Tony Sparrow believes that there are dark powers that live amongst the various voodoo dolls and handmade figurines that are just casually splayed out for museum goers. Stuffed dolls like the Shadow Doll, of course, who looks like a night terror version of a twisted Muppets puppet. It's known for visiting dreamers and stopping their heart mid-nightmare with fear. Uh, okay, that's a little excessive. So haunted, haunted, yeah. There's a satanic doll that looks like it would resemble a tall wooden man, possibly even the devil. Yeah, haunted beyond all hell. Found in the woods too, around satanic worship. Huh, can you believe? And of course, this dark magic doll. They just look haunted, you know? That off colorization look, the facelessness, and glass casing around it. Again, that can't be a good sign. Historically, if you do this, obtaining a doll or statue or carving, add in a little dash of dark magic and voodoo, and voila, you have a very dark cursed item. There's also a doll with no mouth and no eyes. Yeah, that's not scary at all. <laughs> I think we can all agree that there's like 20 origin films like right here with each and every one of these black magic figurines. Like I understand Furbies a little bit more now, you know? Like that's a cursed item right there, 100%. Furbies belong in the War Museum. I'm surprised there isn't some there already. And coming at the number one spot, the music box. And of course we had to include one of the creepiest elements of the Conjuring movies and I guess what makes any scary movie scary. It's the music. And boy is there one haunted creepy worn museum object that comes to mind, the Perrin family music box. Director James Wan wanted to use the actual music box in the first film because mirrors and creepy music make for the best thrillers, but also because that there is a real haunted artifact from the real case. Today, the box is safely stored in the Warrens Museum alongside all of the other spooky items that we already covered. The music though, right? Like this part in the movie actually scared the out of me. Like the anticipation alone. They always do it so slow too, don't they? Dun 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 But it's like real life though. That's horrifying. The music box apparently caused a lot of problems for these Perrin girls, specifically April, the youngest of the Perrin children. She found this antique in the house and she used to communicate to spirits. In the movie, this was a happy ending. But in real life, the Bathsheba Sherman curse was never really resolved. 
The original OG film, The Conjuring, was one of the best haunted house movies of the last decade that arguably spawned both a franchise and a new respect for old school horror. I wonder what's next for us in the James Wan universe, cause that werewolf paw, yeah, that looks terrifying. Number five on this list is the Bassano vase. The Bassano vase is one of those old family heirlooms that you really don't want to get passed down to you. It started out as a wedding gift, also something that you really don't want to receive on your wedding day. Anyways, it's a pretty vase, so the couple accepted this vase and then tragedy struck. On the night of the wedding, after the ceremony, the bride was found dead in her room. It's said that she had her hands wrapped around this vase as she was dying and in her final breaths before passing, vowed to have her revenge. This little vow at the end muddles things because we're not sure whether it was the vow that cursed the vase or if the vase was already cursed, but whatever. Adding it to the story makes it a little bit more interesting, so she cursed the vase. Either way, at this point, nobody realized that the vase had anything to do with the death of the young bride, which is really too bad. The vase turned into a family heirloom and was passed from generation to generation. As you can imagine, it didn't go so great for those who received this. More people kept dying, all of them extremely mysteriously. Eventually, somebody caught on and decided that this vase needed to get locked up for good. For a time, it was locked up in a secret location and nobody knew where this vase was. It should have stayed that way though. The vase in 1988 saw the light of day again and was sold off to a wealthy bidder who basically just bought an extremely expensive way to die. He died very soon after receiving this vase and thus it began all over again. The vase exchanged hands some more, killing off more and more people as it went. Finally, somebody with some proactive thinking gave it to the police. Now, nobody knows where it ended up. Whether the police destroyed it, hit it, or held onto it is anyone's guess. Number four on this list is the Chained Oak. This one is really interesting, and even though history hasn't necessarily hidden it from us, it's definitely tried to negate the consequences. Atlas Obscura says, The Chained Oak is an old tree wrapped in chains to prevent its branches from falling. This is due to an alleged curse put on the tree when, in 1821, the 15th Earl of Shrewsbury refused a woman's pleas for money. It's said that she then put a curse upon the nearby oak. For every branch that falls from the tree, a member of the Earl's family would die. Later that night, one of the Earl's relatives died suddenly under mysterious circumstances. Convinced that the curse was true, the Earl ordered that the branches of the oak should be chained up to prevent more from falling. I feel for that Earl. Earl's family, man. Like, literally, I'm just a grandkid of this dude, and now if this tree breaks a little bit, I'm gonna die? No thank you. At least the Earl had the sense to chain up the tree and make sure that it won't happen to harm his family. But one big storm rolls through that place and wham, now some random person is just dying. Just pray that you don't happen to be the descendant of this guy, and if you are, cross your fingers those chains were done up tight. Number three, the women from Lem statue. This limestone statue, also known as the Goddess of Death, was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878. Its purpose, or exactly what it was meant to portray, has been lost to time, but many experts believe it may be a fertility statue of an unknown goddess. Whatever the reason for the carving, experts have concluded that it was carved sometime around 3500 BC. After being found in 1878, it was purchased by a man named Lord Elfont. Within six years of having acquired the object, Elfont and all six of his family members had died under mysterious circumstances. The statue passed to a man named Ivor Manucci, who died along with his entire family within four years of the purchase. The same thing happened to its next owner, Lord Thompson Noel, and his family. The statue seemed to disappear for a time before being acquired by Sir Alan Biverbrook, who had a wife, two daughters, and two sons. Yet again, family members members began to drop like flies, with Biverbrook, his daughters, and his wife all passing within a few years. Fearing that they would be next, Biverbrook's sons decided to donate the statue to the Royal Museum in Edinburgh, Scotland, where it was soon put on display. However, the statue was not quite done, and the curator who had handled the statue mysteriously died the next year. The statue is still on display to this day, locked in a heavy glass display case. Number 2. Thomas Busby's Chair our next entry takes us 
to North Yorkshire in 1702, when two criminals, Daniel Audie and his son-in-law, Thomas Busby, came into conflict. They were coin forgers who essentially ran a criminal empire, but Daniel disapproved of Tom's relationship with his daughter. This resulted in a fight which ended with Daniel's untimely demise. Thomas was arrested soon afterwards and sentenced to be there is some variation in what happened next. Some versions of the tale say that Thomas was arrested at his favorite pub, and others say he was allowed back into the bar for his last drink before his death. Whatever the case, before being taken away, he told the other patrons of the pub, May sudden death come to anyone who dare sit in my chair. He was then taken away and... As the local historian and poet William Grange described it, the bones of the poor wretch who had committed murder to fester in the sunshine and blow in the tempest, until they fell piecemeal to earth, and tradition yet tells tales of night wanderers being terrified when passing the dreaded spot. While Thomas began apparently haunting the spot across from the inn where his remains were displayed, the curse he laid on the chair began taking effect. Over the years, many brave souls sat on the chair to prove they were not afraid and paid the price. In 1894, a chimney sweep sat in the chair and was found the next day hanging next to where Busby had been displayed. In 1967, two Air Force pilots sat in the chair as a joke, but when they were driving home that night, they crashed into a tree and did not survive. A few years later, a builder sat in the chair and fell off a roof later that same night. Not long after, a cleaner fell into the chair after slipping while mopping the floor and died of a brain tumor soon after. In 1978, the owner of the now renamed Busby Stoop Inn decided that too many deaths had occurred and donated the chair to the Thirsk museum. Although they didn't technically lock the chair away, they did hang the chair on the wall, five feet off the ground, to prevent anyone from sitting on it and receiving Busby's fatal curse. Number 1. The Bassano Vase Although it has fallen out of favor now, for centuries a common gift given to brides on the day of their weddings were intricate ornate vases. Our next tale begins in the 15th century Italy and spans over 500 years. Legend says that on the day of her wedding, a bride in a village near Napoli found a gift with no clue which of the guests had given it to her. It was a four pound silver vase. She decided to put it in her room for safekeeping before the wedding ceremony. But when the ceremony was due to start, the bride was nowhere to be found. The groom went to her room to look for her and found her lifeless body on the ground with no trace of what had caused the death other than her desperately clutching the silver vase. The bride was buried and the vase was passed on to one of her family members to be taken care of. Within days, the second member of the family was was dead from unknown causes. The vase was given to another member of the family, and when he also passed away, the family made the connection between all the recent tragedies and the Bassano vase. Unsure what to do, they reached out to a local priest who upon hearing the story informed them that whoever had given it to the bride had either cursed it or made it from cursed materials. He advised them to bury it on sacred grounds. They dug a hole and wrote a note, warning, beware. This vase brings death, which they placed inside the cursed vase. The vase was buried and remained underground for the next 500 years. By horrible chance, a man in 1988 was digging and came across the vase. He read the note, but being the skeptical type, discarded it and took the newly found Bassano vase to a local auction house. The vase went up for auction and was sold for the equivalent of $2,270 to the local pharmacist. Within three months, the pharmacist was dead and the vase was sold by his family to a local doctor, who also passed away soon after. The vase developed a reputation after this, and several people who were approached to purchase it refused, but it was eventually bought by an archaeologist who, despite his family's protests, did not believe in curses. He died three months later. His family threw the vase out their window, but a police officer who was passing by saw this and tried to return it. The family refused the vase back and told him of its cursed nature. He tried to give it to multiple different museums, but having heard about the curse, they all refused. Fearing for his life, he did what the bride's family had done over 500 years prior, and buried it in a lead box in a cemetery. Which cemetery he used is unknown, but let us hope that no unwitting soul rediscovers this cursed vase and unleashes it upon humanity once again. Alright, have you ever visited somewhere where you were sure a painting was following you with its eyes? How about a photo that just gave off like bad vibes? So one such item, a seemingly innocent photograph of a distinguished Victorian gentleman named Martin, emerged from the shadows of a dusty attic, akin to a forgotten relic from a long time past.
last. Initially, it graced the owner's display, an intriguing conversation starter lifted from the sepia toned pages of a forgotten family album. See, my apartment conversation starter is the tapestry of the popular Barbie movie universe character, Bibble, that takes up an entire wall of my living room. But hey, to each their own. All right, back to the important stuff today. The passage of time is about to unravel an unsettling narrative woven around this seemingly innocent little picture. The anomaly wasn't visual, but more something you could smell, like an unsettling scent that clung to the photograph like an ethereal residue. The aroma, a mysterious blend of scents by the way, wafted from the each photograph, a scent symphony that defied the logic of temporal confinement. We've got roses dancing with the fragrance of burning embers and a sharp essence of wood mingling with the air. The irregularity of these apparitions painted an eerie aura around the photograph, a scent based enigma that that was like, yo, what the heck? As the unsettling fragrances ebbed and flowed, a decision was made to reach out to the spectral presence suspected to be intertwined with the photograph's history. So what did they do? They grabbed a Ouija board. Yeah, the age old conduit to the supernatural. It became the intermediary between the living and the spirit that was lingering between the photograph and the photograph's frame. The encounter was shockingly devoid of hostility. I say shockingly because hey, if there's one thing I will constantly preach against, it's the use of a Ouija board in any sense. It's like a telephone where you don't know who or what is going to answer and you can't trust anything. And what do you know? The whole household aura? It went from being great to being mm, not so great. The paranormal curtain lifted, revealing a surge in unexplained phenomena that whispered of a restless energy tethered to said photograph. The decision was made. This photograph, now a vessel for the unknown, found itself exiled from the confines of the home, making its way into the hands of a collector. Where did the damn thing wind up? That I can't tell you, but I don't particularly want to come across it anytime soon. So if you bought a weird sepia picture from eBay, burn it, stick it in a trunk, I don't care, bury it for all I know. Well, we might as well stick with the demented artwork theme we've got going so far and move on to what is known as the haunted eBay painting or the hands resist them. Based on a real life photograph of the artist from around the time he was years old, this painting, a spectral dance of a young boy, a doll and disembodied hands, traces its origins to an abandoned brewery where a California couple stumbled upon its eerie presence. Soon after introducing the painting into the sanctum of their home, the couple, besieged by an unfolding narrative of the uncanny, decided to part ways with their newfound possession. So where did they go? Good old eBay. So they presented their artifact to the world accompanied by a cautionary note that echoed accompanied by a cautionary note that echoed with an ominous whisper this painting may or may not possess supernatural powers that could impact or change your life good marketing or a genuine worry now let's see the essence of their warning found roots in alleged nocturnal skirmishes between the painted boy and girl an unsettling manifestation that their daughter ultimately revealed as if extracted from these surreal realms of a ghost story the advertisement carried whispers of the boy stepping beyond the confines of the canvas an occurrence that served as the catalyst for their decision to relinquish their spectral acquisition. The curious drama surrounding this haunted masterpiece reached its crescendo when it found a new custodian in none other than Kim Smith, a gallery owner hailing from Michigan. The gavel of the digital auction pronounced a sum of $1,025, sealing the fate of the hands resist them. But the enigma surrounding this painting refused to be contained within the pixels of online transactions. In a revelation that either deepened the mystique or surprised no in a revelation that either deepened the mystique or surprised nobody, depending on how you look at things, Kim Smith disclosed that her inbox bore witness to a procession of emails, testimonials from individuals claiming visceral reactions just by looking at a photograph of the painting. Reports of repulsion and physical illness became the postscript to the tale of the haunted eBay painting. This ordinary artifact turned conduit to the spectral, illustrating that even in the realm of like e-commerce, the line between the tangible and the ethereal can kind of blur and not in a good way. Now, if you feel ill after my talking about this painting today, please let us know in the comments so we can do a 10 part experiment on everybody's psyche. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't you trust me? Number three on this list is the baker's wedding dress. Marriage is supposed to be one of the happiest times of your life. Finding that partner you intend to spend the rest of your life with and then actually doing just that. Therefore, one of the happiest days of your life should be the day that all of this becomes official your wedding day. That's why it's particularly sad when tragedy or drama occurs on the day of said wedding. Just that is exactly what happened with Anna Baker. Scoop Whoop says, Inside the Baker Mansion in Altoona, USA is the wedding dress of Anna Baker, who fell in love with an iron worker. Legends claim that Anna eloped from her home to get married to her lover, but her father forcibly brought her back and locked her in her bedroom. She then refused to marry anyone else and spent the rest of her life alone. After her death, the members of the Baker family reported spotting Anna's wedding dress at different places around the house. 
Some of them even saw the spirit of Anna Baker moving around the house dressed in that same wedding dress. Imagine literally getting forced back home and locked in your room by your father as you're getting married. It's no wonder that Anna was pissed and why this specific object has become very cursed. Now it's locked up in a case and hidden from the world in the Baker Mansion. It's a good thing that it is because what Scoop Whoop didn't talk about is the fact that this dress can actually be dangerous. As ridiculous as it actually sounds, it has reportedly tried to strangle people in their sleep before. I know that the image of a floating wedding dress trying to suffocate somebody is kind of humorous, but I promise you that you wouldn't be laughing if it happened to you. I like that this thing is locked up, but would be far more comfortable if we just threw it in the fire and were done with it completely. Number two on this list is the Anguished Man painting. The Anguished Man painting is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, a painting of a man in some very clear anguish. The thing is that this man doesn't really look all that human. He hardly has any facial features at all and almost looks a bit like a burn victim. Also, where his eyeballs should be, there's just these two gaping holes and his mouth also looks like one giant hole with no end. Even without the haunting associated with this picture, it's already pretty scary and I personally have no idea why anyone would want it in their home. That's exactly what Sean Robinson did though and he quickly suffered the consequences. Scoop Whoop says, Fascinated by the charm of the Anguished Man painting, Sean Robinson inherited the painting from his grandmother and decided to hang the painting on the wall of his house. Soon after that, Sean and his family started experiencing paranormal events like cracking of the doors in the middle of the night and sudden blood-curdling screams from nowhere. Sean's wife decided to investigate the origin of the painting and found that the artist who painted the painting killed himself and before doing that, he mixed his own blood with the paint that he used in making the painting. Learning this, the couple decided to hide the painting in the basement of their house in Cumbria. So, the first thing about this story that is kind of questionable is how anybody could be fascinated by the charm of this thing. It's gross, and I don't like looking at it, let alone having it hanging in my home. The second thing that's super questionable is why we decided to hide it. I swear, none of these people have ever heard of fire before, guys. Like, great, thank you for hiding it from the world. This is helpful, but what would be even more helpful is if we just took a match and burned it so nobody ever has to deal with it again. I apologize to the artist who painted this thing, but if you're gonna use your own blood and make a haunted painting, then come on, man, kinda deserves to be burned. And finally, number one on this list is the Thomas Busby chair. This chair is freaking deadly, man, and even though it's pretty much safe from public use now, I still hate that it exists. Scoop Whoop says, popularly known as Busby's stoop chair, this wooden furniture is cursed by the spirit of Thomas Busby, who was known to ruthlessly murder people. Before getting hanged for his crimes, he requested to have a meal in his favorite local pub. Upon finishing his meal, he stood and said, may sudden death come to anyone who dares sit on my chair. And ever since then, 63 people who dared to sit on the chair met untimely and terrifying deaths. Later, the owner of the pub donated the chair to the Thursk Museum UK, and it's still there, hung one and a half meters off the ground to prevent any further deaths. Can you imagine owning that pub and being like, oh, no worries, 60 people have died in this chair, all is good. Like, how the heck did we allow 63 separate people to sit in this chair and die? And okay, like, I'm happy that it's hanging one and a half meters off the ground and nobody can sit in it, but guys, come on. This is literally a dangerous weapon that we have right here. The fact that this thing hasn't been totally dismantled is kind of ridiculous. What happens if somebody steals this chair and then decides, you know what, I'm gonna murder people with it without anybody finding out? Frankly, I think history should have hidden this thing a little bit better. Hopefully we don't hear any more murderous stories about it from here on out. Number five on this list is the Die Book Box. This is an evil box that tormented many people and even claimed some lives along the way. Zach Baggins writes, According to Jewish folklore, a diabok is a dark spirit that takes over the bodies of living people and uses them for evil. Legend has it that a diabok can be trapped inside of a box and prevented from causing mischief unless the box is opened, that is. Several years ago, the diabok box came up for sale on eBay. The seller listed a vintage wine cabinet that came from the estate of a woman who survived a world 
War II concentration camp. The seller, an antique dealer named Kevin Manis, claimed that the first owner's granddaughter was terrified of the box, warning him that her grandmother said it held a dye book. After buying the cabinet, he was plagued by a series of unfortunate events and recurring nightmares of an old hag that would brutally attack him, causing him to wake up with bruises on his body. He also experienced an overpowering stench of cat urine in his home. Tragically, his mother suffered a stroke while opening the box. Not surprisingly, he decided to get rid of it. The box eventually ended up in the hands of Missouri Medical Museum director Jason Haxton, who was skeptical about the powers attributed to the box. He soon changed his mind. After acquiring the box, he began to experience a series of medical maladies, including bleeding eyes and strange rashes. He also began to dream of being attacked by an old hag and would also awake with bruises on his body. Kevin Manis told me that while the box was in Haxton's basement, a man died there and his body was found lying next to the box. He eventually became so unnerved by the box that he reached out to scientists and rabbis who instructed him to build a wooden ark lined with 24 karat gold, place the box inside, and bury it in the ground. Now this actually wasn't the end of the story for this box. The box was eventually dug up again and then later donated to a museum. This was after it had tormented a few more people, mind you, though. Now, it's fully encased in a glass covering, but even that doesn't stop the evil spirit from coming after people. Many people who have visited this box have reported having serious episodes in the room while they're looking at it. Whatever spirit is trapped inside this box, it is clearly an extremely powerful one. The box remains on display at the museum, but I wouldn't recommend going to check it out if I was you. Number four on this list is the Devil's Rocking Chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair is actually from one of Ed and Lorraine Warren most famous case, The Devil Made Me Do It. Zach Baggins writes, The horror began in July 1980 when David Glatzel, 11 years old, became possessed by a demon. One night he woke up screaming, claiming that he had been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. David was, everyone agreed, not the kind of kid who liked scary movies or who was likely to make things up, and he he was visibly shaken up by this experience. He became rather withdrawn and quiet. His older sister, Debbie, asked her fiance, Orrin Johnson, if he would stay with her family for a while and see whether it would help David get out of his depression. Orrin, of course, agreed, but things didn't get better. David reported having more nightmares about the terrifying man who promised to take his soul. Odd scratches and bruises began to appear on the boy, and all the injuries seemed to happen while he was asleep. Odd sounds which Arn couldn't explain were heard in the attic. Worst of all, David began to claim that he was now seeing the beast while he was awake. He was always seen sitting in the family's rocking chair, which the beast now claimed as his own. David was the only one who saw the beast in the chair, but family members often saw it rocking back and forth, seemingly under its own power. This was obviously a lot, so the Warrens were brought in to perform the exorcism. The exorcism took place in that rocking chair, and it's thought that the chair itself still has some evil energy from this spirit attached to it. Now the chair resides at the haunted museum, but owner Zach Beggins actually took the exhibit down because the chair was simply too dangerous, he thought. Here's something you don't see every day, or at least I don't. How about we try on a haunted bra for size? Not actually a weirdos, just in theory. It's one of the weirdest frightening, but maybe one of the least sanitary items posted on eBay on today's list. All right, picture this folks, a one-time used bra, white and kind of ratty, and designed for a woman with a 32 a bust, but it's also packing some major spirit power. Or so claims Tanya Rose, the woman selling it. But this isn't a secondhand bra, it is a third hand bra. Because the listing claims it belonged to a deceased woman, one who lived a life with a lot of amorous adventures and partying before she met an untimely end. So why would you want it? Because according to the seller, the spirit of this crazy lady never quite left. Her spirit is still hanging around in her bra, and anyone who wears it will inherit her success in the romantic world. Get ready for a big increase in the number of admirers and gifts. But it may not have wound up with a woman. 
because it supposedly has another ability. So if you're gonna put a lit white candle near the bra, the spirit of the woman will appear. But if you're gonna place a red candle, the owner's gonna come back and greet you with a very sensual encounter with the spirit world. And while this is terrifying at all, it kind of reminds me of another haunted bra from pop culture. Anybody remember George the bra from iCarly? Does anybody remember George the bra from iCarly? So he was this large pink bra who told ghost stories to anybody watching. And he made his first appearance on an iCarly sketch in the episode I Give Away a Car, and also appeared at the beginning of I Saved Your Life. Heck, at one time there was even a segment on the actual website, iCarly.com, that was dedicated to his stories. So I guess he's not the only haunted bra anymore. Okay folks, we're gonna move on to a different bust, uh, object. Sorry, it was an easy joke and I've spent way too much time lately around folks who have mastered the groaning style of humor. The genesis of this haunting creation is intertwined with the tragic demise of its creator, William. Crafting sculptures from unhardened clay was his passion, a pursuit that meant eh, an untimely end on the day he was crushed to death in a work-related accident at the brickyard. The statue, a product of that fateful day, stood as a spectral relic, a tangible link between the artist's final moments and the unknown afterlife. A twist on the tale comes as a fellow laborer, bearing witness to the aftermath of the tragedy, laid eyes on the forlorn statue at the job site the following day. The decision to take it home marks the inception of a series of unsettling events. Initially dormant, the statue's dormant malevolence sprang to life when it was unearthed from its storage confines and proudly displayed in the den. Now the den, once a, you know, a sanctuary, because we all love a good cozy space, transformed into an oppressive space, laden with an unexplained heaviness that permeated the air. The mundane act of doors slamming of their own accord became an eerie symphony. With the culprit, plot investigation, revealing wide open portals into the unknown. Nearby decorations, juxtaposed with the malevolent sculpture, met their demise in spontaneous acts of shattering. The inanimate bust, you know, anchored in the physical realm, defied the laws of, well, everything. It exhibited a will of its own, orchestrating a macabre ballet as it pivoted to face the wall without even the slightest human intervention. The surreal crescendo reached its peak when a dark shadow or mist, an elusive apparition, materialized in said den, heightening the spectral ambiance. Terrified by the unfolding supernatural saga, the owner was like, okay, let's get rid of this thing, I can't do it anymore. Desperation and fear impelled him to beseech a friend to orchestrate the artifacts of exodus from his life, if you will. The friend, perhaps understanding the gravity of the situation, turned to eBay. I feel like Christian Borg when I say that. Thrusting the haunted statue into the labyrinthine corridors of online auctions, leaving its paranormal legacy for a new, unwitting custodian to unravel. And people wonder why young folks aren't buying random art to display in their homes anymore. Seriously. Alrighty, everybody, we're gonna end today with some of my favorite haunted items in the whole wide world, haunted dolls. Since they're sadly a bit of a cliche, I figured it was best to save them until the end of our time, so I didn't risk anybody getting bored right off the bat, and so I wouldn't be tempted to turn today into a top five scary dolls for sale. Granted, I might still do that, to be determined. The doll that mostly caught my attention today was this beautiful Anne of Green Gables doll. With her copper braids, dark green dress, straw hat, and porcelain skin, she'd fit in really nicely amongst my personal collection. But this doll, located in Windsor, Ontario, came with a picture of her supposed spirit. The description says, this is not a joke, she is very active. Now, I already own a couple of demon dolls, so maybe I don't want to mess with too many spirits. The seller claims that the doll was purchased at a garage sale 20 years ago and has moved positions on its own. And it could be yours for a mere $60 plus shipping, which is a steal if you ask me. I was performing at an oddities market recently, and the haunted dolls at that event were going for a premium, mostly because in a crowd like that, it's pretty easy to find out if the item in question is a fake. Oh, you don't believe me? Okay, well, let's see. We've got this event. It was run by a world-renowned mind reader who owns one of the most spirited dolls I've ever been in the presence of. If you've heard of Walt, yeah, his owner. One of the vendors, another one of the vendors was an extremely experienced tarot reader who can call BS in an instant. And uh, hey, I was also there, and I could tell pretty quickly if a doll has a mind of its own or not after owning a couple of gals with, you know, personalities, if I'm being polite. I've mentioned a couple of times, but if you don't know anything about my cursed dolls, I do recommend pausing this video and watching the one I did on haunted dolls you've never heard about, where I did a big deep dive into my collection and my friend Mysterion's collection. So long story short, haunted dolls at events like that are the real thing. If Anne with an E wasn't creep, if Anne with an E wasn't creepy enough for you though, back in 2021, a doll from Sault Ste. Marie named Karini has apparently been heard saying her name out loud and even moves around sometimes and moves around objects. The seller has added a disclaimer that you might not witness the paranormal activity described, so don't be disappointed if she behaves like the inanimate object that she is. And that's the thing with a lot of, you know, demon dolls. It depends on who they're around and if they want to or not. And since I'm on a tangent anyways, there was another nightmare doll that caught my eye because she reminds me of my own kissy kissy baby doll. Now this doll might look like any other, but according to the seller, it's pretty cursed. A seller who specializes in selling paranormal items that people don't want anymore says the doll's owner bought it at an antique shop and was told that it was cursed, but the seller used a lot of words that the gal didn't know. So she's like, ah, you know what, it'll come home with me, whatever, I'll take care of it. So soon after, whenever she would open the doll that it came in or touch the doll, she would suffer She would suffer from terrifying nightmares of shadow people. This continued for several months until her son took it from her to sell it, and it sold for only $17.49, which, once again, steal of a deal. And that brings us to the end of our time.
time, and I think I'm gonna stick to getting my haunted items from markets where I know the sources. Besides, that way I save big time on the shipping costs and the risk. Number five on this list is Robert the Doll. Robert the Doll is one of the most haunted and cursed dolls on the entire planet. Ghosts and Gravestone says the story of Robert the Doll dates back to the early 1900s when a young boy named Eugene Robert Otto was given a one of a kind handmade doll by a servant that worked for his parents in his home. Eugene, who everybody called Gene, named the doll Robert and quickly became attached to his new friend. The home where Eugene lived, now called the Artist's House, is located at 534 Eaton Street and was built between 1890 and 1898. It was here that Eugene was given Robert the doll and where a friendship that lasted throughout his lifetime and beyond was forged. While he seemed like an ordinary cloth doll, it wasn't long before Robert was involved in strange and somewhat terrifying events. The first hint that something out of the ordinary was happening was one night when Jean, who was only 10 years old, awoke to find Robert the doll sitting at the end of his bed staring at him. Moments later, his mother was awakened by his screams for help and the sounds of furniture being overturned in her son's bedroom. Jean cried for help, begging his mother to rescue him. When she was finally able to wrench the locked door open, she saw poor Jean curled up in fear on his bed, his room in shambles, and Robert the doll sitting at the foot of the bed. And all the child could say was Robert did it. Now this was the first instance where Robert was acting up, but there have been tons of experiences since then where this doll is just doing things that mm, really shouldn't be doing. He now lives in East Martello where visitors flock to see him, although it's a bad idea. There are letters and notes all around Robert from people that have come to see him all begging for Robert's forgiveness. Apparently taking a picture of Robert without his permission will cause him to start to haunt you. This curse has affected hundreds to thousands of people and they all usually end up coming back to Robert begging for freedom from this curse. At this point, paranormal investigators have learned that messing with Robert really isn't the best idea and just leaving this doll alone, probably the smartest thing to do. Number four on this list is the screaming skull. Last I checked, if there is no meat on the bone, then a skull shouldn't be screaming. That's kind of what's going down with this one extremely haunted skull in Burton Agnes Hall, England. Instablog says, what if you touch an object and then you hear terrible deafening screams. That is precisely what happens when you touch this skull at an Elizabethan manor in England. Burton Agnes Hall is the house of Catherine Ann Griffith, who was brutally murdered by numerous bullies in 1620. Her skull still rests inside the house. Why? Because whenever somebody tried to take it out of the house, what happened next terrified them to the bone. People who have tried to touch or disturb that skull have reported seeing a scary ghost walk in and utter a deafening scream. This scared the people so much that they actually ran out of the house in terror. If you're up for a scary challenge, then this might be your chance to prove your mettle to the world, but for the weak-hearted ones, it's wise to stay away. And yeah, guys, I mean, I agree with that article right there. Probably best not to mess with this thing. I mean, a bunch of paranormal investigators won't even go here anymore. If a bunch of paranormal investigators think that this area is too scary for them, then sorry guys, I'm tapping out. It's way too scary for me too. Number three on this list is the Hope Diamond. Don't get me wrong, guys. I would love to have this thing, but I just don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze here. Google Arts and Culture says, one of the most famous diamonds in the world, the Hope Diamond, originated in the Kular Mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. According to legend, the stone is cursed and brings misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief met a grisly end, kick-starting a pattern of misfortune for all those who possessed the diamond. Over the years, owners of the Hope Diamond have befallen fates including death by murder, execution, 
They've taken their own lives, bankruptcy, and imprisonment. Thankfully, the curse seems to have been lifted when the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian in 1958. Now, I don't really buy into the fact that this curse is lifted, in my opinion. Like, literally, if you own this diamond, then you die or someone you love dies. That's what's happened throughout history. In the best possible case scenario, you just get hit with, like, horrible luck and lose all your money or some other horrible thing. There just really isn't any good way to spin this. This, owning the Hope Diamond is pretty much a horrible idea. Number two on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. Do not get on a boat if said boat is also carrying this mummy. Google Arts and Culture says the Unlucky Mummy isn't actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin lid of a high status woman who lived in around 950 to 900 BCE. Discovered in Thebes in the 1800s, the four young Englishmen who first purchased the mummy all died in unfortunate circumstances. Rumors of the curse soon spread, and in the early 20th century, journalist William Thomas Steed wrote an article on the jinxed artifact. Steed went on to be one of the passengers on the doomed Titanic. It's said that he told stories of the curse in the run-up to the disaster, with many believing that the mummy itself caused the ship's watery end. Today, the unlucky mummy is on display in the British Museum. The Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable. Enter in the unlucky mummy, and boom, now the unsinkable ship goes down. Maybe it's a stretch to say that this thing caused the literal titanic crash, but I can at least guarantee that it probably didn't help. At least this thing is now locked up in a museum very much on land and not connected to any boats that I know of. And number one on this list is the Hands Resist Him painting. I'm all about having some cool groundbreaking art, but this painting definitely crosses the line. The lineup says there is no doubt the painting is disturbing. It shows a young boy standing next to a girl doll with hollow eyes and a sad, downturned mouth. The doll is holding a strange device with wires coming out of it. The eeriest part of the painting are the many disembodied children's hands reaching toward the boy through the glass panels of a door just behind him. But even more disturbing than the painting itself are the stories of what has happened to people who come in contact with it. A few years after the painting was sold, the art critic Henry Seldes died. Then the gallery owner died. Then in 1984, John Marley died. Died. The painting disappeared, not surfacing again until 2000 in a bizarre posting on eBay. The new owners were trying to sell it because, they said, it was haunted. They claimed the boy and the doll in the picture would fight with each other during the night, terrifying their four-year-old daughter. They set up a motion sensing camera in the room for three nights and claimed they had captured the boy in the picture, leaving the frame and coming into the room, apparently fleeing in terror. The literal kid in the painting is leaving. Not freaking cool, guys. My paintings are supposed to be static and not moving, and they definitely aren't supposed to be walking around my home scaring the living bejesus out of me and my family. Apparently, this painting is locked up in a storage locker now, and no one is allowed to see it. In fifth place, we have a satanic idol. This story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut, close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost, and after some time, stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question, standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car, and along the way he noticed an elderly gentleman walking alongside him who was dressed in head to toe black. The man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. Now the hunter was getting more nervous by the second and also more lost and unsure of his directional path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, the man in black pointed in a direction and then disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed who requested to be brought to the same area. Now the hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location but was willing to try. Together, the two men were able to stumble through the forest and without the aid of the man in black this time, found the rock from. Ed removed the demonic idol from the area and placed it in the museum, and that's when things got a little weirder. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason, and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify what was wrong with her. Thankfully, after three more days, she recovered. Now, Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black, who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult, as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. In fourth place, we have a conjuring book. So one night, after returning home from a night out with Ed, Lorraine was reviewing the calls left on the answering machine when she found one from a distraught woman who introduced herself as a Mrs. Sandy Foster, who nervously described a very distressing situation and begged the Warrens to return her call. So even though it was like 12.40 in the morning, Lorraine immediately tried to call her back, and while the phone rang continuously, the connection was broken. 
Lorraine tried a few more times, going so far as to contact the phone operator and the operator's supervisor, who ran tests on the phone line and frustratingly didn't find anything weird. The next day, when the Warrens returned home from church, Lorraine immediately phoned the foster home again. This time, Mrs. Foster answered the phone on the second ring and mentioned that the phone had never rang the night before, and Lorraine made the decision to go pay the fosters a visit that afternoon. She and Ed arrived at around 2 p.m. and met not only Mrs. Foster and her husband, but also their three offspring, Abby, Joel, and Hannah, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg, the three offspring, Abby, Joel, and Meg, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg had always been interested in the occult and had purchased a book on conjuring as a gift for Meg. And based off of the description Ed gave of it, I believe it was a copy of the Ars Goetia. Now Meg admitted to attempting to summon a few of the spirits in the book, but had lost hope because nothing had happened. Ed prompted further, asking for specifics on the experiences that had happened in the last week when only the younglings were home. So let's set the scene. The boys were already in bed and Meg had just taken a shower. After going downstairs to make sure the doors were locked and you know the lights were off, Meg returned upstairs to the sounds of running water and the faucets had turned back on without any human's touch. Now downstairs, the lights and the radio had turned back on as well. Meg went downstairs and watched the radio dial moving on its own. After turning it off again, she got halfway up the stairs when she felt an icy cold hand touch her on the shoulder, just for a second in the dark. Now Meg bolted up the rest of the stairs, into her room, shut the door, turned off the lights, and hid under her covers. Outside the door, sounds of heavy footsteps caused her to suddenly shake under her covers. And then, more noises joined in with the mysterious steps. A door downstairs slammed shut, accompanied by furniture being pushed around and crashing, almost as if an angry person had broken into remodel. When Meg was able to open her eyes again, she saw a silver light come out of the woods and glide into her room. The next thing she knew, something, some hand, yanked her hair three times. Each time it pulled harder, until the third time it made her eyes water. Now, she ran into her brother's room for safety, and he confirmed that he was also terrified by hearing the assorted unknown noises. Accompanied by loud whispering he could not make out. The duo eventually gathered enough courage to call their parents at the home they were at, but by the time the adults returned, all of the paranormal action had paused, and they were convinced the offspring were um, making it up. On the second occasion, everything that happened was almost the same as the first, but this time they involved the family dog, who was snarling at something that no one could see. Now Joel remembered it as strange, because the dog was deaf and could barely hear noise. So when the wards were hiding in a bedroom on this occasion, instead of a silver figure, they saw a dark purplish cloud that they were unable to look at directly. So Lorraine at this point had returned and reported that she had experienced an inhuman presence throughout the home and asked Meg if she possessed, you know, black conjuring candles in her room. And when she responded yes, Ed told the family that he and Lorraine can handle everything, but um, they should maybe head out for a drive while it was happening. For safety. Ed and Lorraine got to work the moment the Fosters left, determined to discover the true nature of the spirit's presence in order to dispel it. For provocation purposes, Ed used a crucifix and holy water, scattering the water at all four points of the cellar floor, and saying aloud, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command all spirits, whether human or diabolical, to leave this dwelling and never return. On the first floor, Ed repeated the same procedure in each of the rooms. This process, known to any exorcist as binding, requires the infesting spirit to either show itself or move on. Having bound the cellar and all downstairs room without incident, the Warrens were ready to approach the second floor, where they knew difficulty was lurking. But as they prepared to act, a telepathically projected feeling of dread came over them, which is a distinct indication of an inhuman demonic presence. They pressed on and began climbing the staircase to the second floor. But as hard as they tried, neither Ed nor Lorraine could get any more than halfway up, pushing against them with some impenetrable, unyielding force. So slowly, the Warrens backed down the stairs so as not to be knocked over backwards. And at the bottom of the stairs, for a brief second, and diabolical laughter rang out. So, annoyed, Ed threw more holy water on the stairs, which caused the pressure to diminish enough to let them reach the top. They were able to bind almost all the rooms without incident, saving Meg's for last. Ed swung the door wide open, and he and Lorraine immediately felt the need to take a step back from the horrible sense of misery emanating from the room. With a steely composure, Ed walked into the room, cross in hand. Though no physical presence was there to be seen, the bedroom was freezing cold. One last time, Ed threw holy water in all four corners of the room, commanding, give us some sign of departure or an exorcism will be conducted here this very day. Almost instantly, the morbid sense of misery began to drain away, and the temperature in the room gradually returned to normal. So Meg's bedroom did contain those black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and books containing the rites for rituals of all sorts. Ed placed the items in the gal's trash basket, set them out in the hallway, and then sealed the room by reading a prescribed prayer of sanctification. He brought them back to his home for safekeeping, and uh, that's one copy of the Ars Goetia I have no need to read. Thank you! See, I've told y'all, 
don't summon beings. Number three on this list is the Maori warrior masks. Now these warrior masks hold a curse that won't affect everyone, just a small portion of people. Specifically, women who are soon to be expecting children. The Occult Museum says, New Zealand's Maori warriors are part of an ancient tribe who would carve unique masks when it was time for battle. When a man died in the mask, it was believed that his soul would remain trapped in the mask they were wearing. Although their mythology does not dictate that any harm is done by the trapped souls, the presence of the masks has a strange and sometimes fatal effect on pregnant women. Women who are expecting often experience complications when they come in contact with the masks. It's unknown why this phenomenon occurs, but the museum that holds the remaining masks posts a warning that pregnant women should stay away. The literal museum is out here warning pregnant women not to come. That's how you know that this thing's seriously dangerous. Like whenever a business or enterprise does something that's actually gonna lose them money, that's when you have my attention. Considering they just lost an entire demographic of people, I'm now listening and buying into this curse. The paranormal investigators who aren't pregnant have taken a look at this and they're having a hard time getting to the bottom of it. Some people have suggested that the Maori tribe thought that pregnant women were taboo, but that also doesn't really make any sense because then how would they have repopulated their tribe? Regardless of why it is the way that it is, just know that if you are expecting, that's not the right time to take a look at these masks. Number two on this list is the Surrey Ghost Car. So this is a weird one and definitely something that paranormal investigators are a bit spooked by. List 25 says crashes are common on the A3 highway in England, so it looked like a routine matter when police in Surrey received calls that a car had veered off the A3 with its headlights blazing. But when officers went to investigate, they found no signs of the reported vehicle. However, a further search revealed chilling results. Just 60 feet from the reported crash scene, and buried in twisted undergrowth was the remains of a wrecked car containing a decomposing body of a young man who, as the police estimated, had crashed there five months earlier. Therefore, what the witnesses reported might have been a ghostly apparition of the original car. Now, how on earth does that make any sense at all? You know what, let me answer that for you. It doesn't. First off, how did no one notice this car earlier and then what was that ghostly apparition that had a car veer off the road? Paranormal investigators are all scared of this one because who knows what type of effect this ghost car could have on your vehicle. And finally, number one on this list is the cursed mirror. This mirror isn't just cursed with a bad reflection, it's gonna show you something a lot worse than just you with a little bedhead or something. Instablog says, if you've seen Oculus, then chances are already you're scared of mirrors. And let's not even go back to the time when Bloody Mary was a whole thing. But if these creepy images of mirrors in the horror genre weren't enough, here's a real object which is most likely cursed. In St. Francisville, Louisiana, there's a plantation house which is one of the most haunted houses in America. Inside the house is this mirror, a cursed mirror. Legend goes that the plantation slave brutally killed the owner of the house named Sarah Woodruff and her daughters inside the house. Ever since then, they remain trapped inside the mirror. Visitors often report sights of handprints on the mirror, along with some unexplainable strange marks. And the classic haunting is also rumored, figures dressed in white, old-fashioned attire, visible on the other side of the mirror. Some people who have been exposed to this mirror for longer than they should say that these figures in white follow them around too. That they've even seen them appear in other mirrors outside of the plantation and one or two of them have talked about how they've seen them outside of a mirror entirely as if they were standing like right in front of them. It seems like the longer that you're exposed to this, the more of an impact the curse will have on you. Kind of like, I don't know, radiation poisoning or something like that, where the time you spend among the toxin, that's gonna hurt you more. Obviously, because of this, paranormal investigators don't wanna spend too long investigating this mirror. A short stint doing some research 
probably won't hurt you, although it will definitely give you a scare considering you're gonna see the figures on the other side. But extended exposure is where the real danger lies with this cursed item. Number five, the organ. Music is the basis of like every good horror movie, isn't it? Music playing from the other room by itself, yeah, that scares the shit out of me. When I forget my Bluetooth is on and I hear the music from the other room, my heart skips a beat. And there's some Shakespeare sonnets on there, you know? So it sounds like some dudes in the other room just talking to me in old English. Well, there's actually an instrument that plays by itself, apparently, every night around 9 p.m. Unless it has priests bless it to keep it only wood and ivory. Apparently it likes to play a little number or two from the other side. Residing in the Warren's Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut, Ed Warren, the husband of the famous demonologist duo, apparently likes his classic music. Well, not live, I should say. He obtained the organ apparently after authorities cleaned out a haunted house owned by Reverend Eliakim Phelps in Stratford, Connecticut. Somebody from the authority at the city of Stratford reached out to Ed asking him if he'd be interested in obtaining a musical instrument in which needed some special handling. Nothing like a dusty old haunted organ. Like the old hockey games and churches organs, you know? Apparently one night, Ed was woken up by the sounds of the chords of the organ being played. It was late at night, so naturally, Ed thought maybe someone had broken in and was fiddling downstairs with the instrument. Ed went down to check it out, and as soon as he entered the museum where the Warren's haunted items are kept, the organ would just stop. Yeah. Creepy. And also annoying. Like, why do ghosts always do that? It's so, like, trickster of them, you know? This would happen over and over and over again. The organ finally stayed quiet semi-permanently when after the Warrens asked a priest to bless the organ on a regular basis. Apparently it needed to be continuously cleansed or else the mysterious pianist would start their eerie tune again. Yeah, organs have to be the scariest instrument on this planet. So Halloween-y sounding, you know what I mean? And so Dracula-ish. Toccata and D minor, just Number four, the wedding dress. Your wedding day is supposed to be the happiest day of your life, isn't it? Dress to the nines, till death do us part, cake smashed into your face, yada yada yada, and of course, that iconic wedding dress, you know? Yeah, it's tradition. So what's this wedding dress doing in the Warren's Occult Museum then? Well, the official story behind the white gown in the Occult Museum is that of the White Lady of Union Graveyard. She has been spotted for decades. Many claim they have seen the lady in white at Union Cemetery. She's said to walk the graveyard at night and locals tell us they've also seen her on nearby roads. Union Cemetery sits just off the junction of routes 59 and 136 in Easton, Connecticut. The legend goes, it's the home of a spiritual entity that allegedly walks the property. I can tell you that now for a fact that this place is haunted. It's one of the most haunted places around, said Lorraine Warren herself. Yeah, and she's seen some stuff in her time. One of the most infamous encounters is that late one night, a man was driving down Stepney Road in his pickup truck just past Union Cemetery. Out of nowhere, a woman in a white dress appeared in the middle of the road. The man couldn't slow down in time and struck the woman head on. When the man screeched to the side of the road, there was no sight of the woman he had hit. Apparently this happens more often than you think on that road. Whoever she was, apparently the couple has her dress locked in the Museum of the Occult Finds and deems it spooky enough to leave it alone. In third place, we have a shadow doll. Among one of the first haunted items visible to those who visit the Warren Occult Museum is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth. And she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now. She better join that TV universe one day. For reference, a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while I'll leave out a step for safety, I promise I'll elaborate. Now, the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and uh, then send it to whoever the curse is aimed for. You know, hopefully you've got their mailing address. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. Oh, I uh, almost forgot. The doll is also going to appear in that person's dream, so enjoy your nightmares, folks. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a secondhand store under the assumption that it was simply, you know, an antique. I've got a couple of old dolls myself, and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. Some of them talk enough already. In second place, we have Black Magic Mask, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal, of a materialized thought form, typically in human form such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a closed Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for a creature of the mind. Tulpas do not become part of Western paranormal 
paranormal lore until around the 1970s. And those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of telepomancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009. And I'm not going to elaborate on just how awful that sentence was to utter. Oh, it gets worse. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Well, I think that about sums that up, don't you? In first place, we have the Black Lace Veil. So after one of their many public lectures, Ed was conversing with a couple that had been in the audience, where the boy introduced himself as Alan and explained that he'd brought his girlfriend Lonnie to the lecture because he suspected that she'd been overtaken by some occult influence. He explained that when his girlfriend became angry, her features would change into something resembling a wolf, and then the voice of a different person would speak from inside her. When Lorraine walked over to join the group, Lonnie experienced an episode of instantaneous possession and lurched out in an attempt to attack Lorraine. This incident terrified everyone in the vicinity, with the Warrens ending the audience chat session immediately, before Ed escorted the couple to an offstage room while Lorraine stayed outside. In the backstage room, the girl was fully under possession, breathing heavily, and her facial features had transformed into the wolf-like appearance the boy had talked about. After about 10 minutes, the possession passed, and Lonnie was lucid enough to explain, you know, dealing with memory loss, along with losing hours and days of her life over the last three months, which is a symptom common in possession. She went on to share that originally her now boyfriend, Alan, had refused all of her advances and bribery attempts at becoming hers, and she had resorted to visiting a store prominent and selling tools to help with witchcraft, purchasing there a book on the black arts, and later that night performing a ritual for acquiring lovers. This ritual involved, you guessed it, the black lace veil, on top of which she placed a crown of goat horns before renouncing God and her her baptism, along with swearing allegiance to Satan, finishing the ritual by washing down the vow with a cup of animal scarlet elixir. About a month after Lonnie performed the ritual, Alan began paying her the attention she craved, making her entitled world perfect. What she hadn't counted on, however, was that she was now in debt to the demonic, having given them permission to enter her life. Ed knew immediately that Lonnie would have to undergo an exorcism as soon as possible, and made contact with a priest the next morning, who was able to come assist with the procedure. Upon arrival, the priest insisted on testing the spirit, so he instructed Lonnie to to close her eyes and slowly count to 20, while his assistant stood behind her and placed a cross around 6 inches behind her head. The entity possessing the girl suddenly went wild, screaming, take it away, it burns, take it away. During the exorcism, it kept screaming, she's mine, she's mine, her soul is mine, in reference to Lonnie. It was eventually separated from Lonnie, but just before it departed, the thing vowed it would return to another. The Warrens brought the black lace veil, goat horns, cup, and the conjuring book home with them so she would be safe from possession, but the tale of the veil doesn't end here. Months later, when Ed was in a meeting with a lady who was manifesting different personalities, you know, some male, some female, and some that couldn't even be called human, but all making extremely threatening statements, her eyes began to wander. And when they landed on the black veil, she jumped up, grabbed the veil, and clutched it to her chest. Her features immediately began to transform into those of a wild, sneering creature distinct from the otherwise attractive girl. Ed drew two vials of water to himself, one unblessed, the other blessed by an exorcist, and moved away from what was no longer this woman, but an inhuman spirit, a lesser devil of hell. Horrid moaning and various animal sounds came from the girl as Ed blessed her, banishing the demon away for now a second and final time. And that brings us to the end of our list, and I'm glad all of those items are still kicking around the Warren Museum for safety and uh, not out in the open. Our first spot is the Anguished Man painting, a painting that's been said to be haunted by the spirit of its former artist. The Anguished Man was painted by... we have no idea, actually. Fittingly, for something like this, its true origin is a mystery, but it's been said that it was painted with a mixture of the artist's own blood and paint, which explains that delightful crimson hue. The artist disappeared after painting it, and in 30 years, no one has been able to trace its origin to anyone. The earliest recorded history of the Anguished Man comes from a woman in North England who owned the painting after receiving it as a gift, and understood that there was something deeply, deeply wrong with it but kept it anyway, I guess. After years of having it in her possession, she gave the relic off and passed it on to her grandson, Sean Robinson. Once the painting found its way into Sean's possession, he reported consistent hauntings from it, claiming that at night, the painting can be heard screaming, writhing, loud noises, the painting falling off the wall in the middle of the night, and even going so far as to claim that he's seen the canvas itself twisting. Locking the painting in his basement, but feeling a compulsion to keep it locked to study it and possibly keep it safe from the outside world, Sean has recorded several videos of the Anguished Man in action if you feel like you've been getting too much sleep lately. While some skeptics might doubt that the Anguished Man is actually haunted, there is absolutely zero doubt that the painting itself is as fascinating as it is 
terrifying. Robert the doll. At first glance already seems a bit unsettling, between his empty smile and the blank expression of the pet sitting on his lap. If only it ended there. Legend has it that this century old doll is home to a malevolent spirit locked away. It's been said that misfortune comes to those who don't respect him or insult him. Robert's story begins over a hundred years ago, and his true origin is somewhat disputed. It's agreed that he was owned by Robert Jean Otto, who received it as a boy, but some people claim that it was a gift from his grandfather, while locals prefer to claim nefariously that the doll was given to Robert by a servant of the house who hexed it out of resentment. Whatever the case, Robert brought trouble with him. The real Robert, or Jean as he went by, would refer to the doll as if it was a living entity, claiming that it had a will of its own. When things around the house would break, like the rest of Jean's toys being destroyed, he claimed that Robert had done it. The family would find Jean in the middle of the night, wailing, surrounded by overturned furniture, claiming once again that Robert had done it. People would claim to see Robert out of the windows, appearing and disappearing at seemingly random times of day. While Jean no longer owns Robert, of course, Robert lived in the East Martello Museum in Florida, where it's said that even locked up he still causes havoc, causing electronics to malfunction and go haywire. Employees have reported sleepless nights, strange noises, streaks of bad luck after spending time around Robert. The museum claims too Robert gets one to three letters a day from people asking for forgiveness or asking him to place a curse on others. If you're ever in the area and you feel like checking in, just make sure you're respectful about it, okay? You never know. Number three, the purple sapphire. Well, not really a sapphire, but actually an amethyst. The spiky purple quartz looking thing. Hey, who said that haunted to hell items can't be precious and beautiful? Well, don't say that, because apparently this one is cursed, like curse cursed. The mysterious Delhi purple sapphire is now permanently on display as part of the Natural History Museum's vault collection of precious gemstones. The mysterious stone is rumored to have been stolen by a British soldier from the Temple of Indra, the Hindu god of war and weather, in Kanpur, India, during the Indian Mutiny of 1857. It was brought to England by Colonel W. Ferris, whose family then supposedly suffered many financial and many health problems. I love how financials first. The stone was given to Edward Heron Allen, a scientist and writer in 1890, who claimed to have started having bad things happen to him and those who were lucky enough or unlucky enough to see or hold it. He came to the conclusion it was hexed with a curse and eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Allen warned that the Delhi purple sapphire is cursed and is stained with blood and the dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. Weary of its alleged powers, he kept it locked away in seven boxes and surrounded by good luck charms. He also left strict instructions not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. It's very specific. Heron Allen's own daughter was forbidden under every circumstance to even touch or handle the stone, which, half a year after her father's death, she donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum where it's on display today. Okay, so his own daughter donated this thing. She didn't even want it. That's a little spooky. Now, I mean, he was a writer, and writers can exaggerate sometimes, but not giving it to his own daughter and her not wanting it at all after his death? That sounds a little bizarre to me. Number two, the haunted book. Okay, so sometimes we all find spooky doodles from the past we drew as kids, finding old spooky pictures or letters written. That could be fun and great for scary stories. Apparently, I drew aliens a lot. Yeah, who'd have thought? This next item holds more than just letters, though. It holds power. This haunted book was given to Brighton's very own haunted house, Preston Manor, after a Kent family who owned it claimed it caused them to be plagued by ghostly visitors and spectral visions. A haunted ledger which was found bricked up behind a shop wall has been acquired by the museum. Phew. The ledger was donated by Josephine Benyovitz. The book was discovered by her father, Tony Benyovitz, in 1988 when he was demolishing a shop which closed in 1984. Having taken it home, the father and daughter believed they suffered a number of spiritual visions and images of men, women, children, and apparently soldiers on horseback. The ledger, which dates from the First World War, was a clue at maybe who was visiting them. The daughter was told by one of the spirits that the book must be returned to Brighton where its first entry was written, which was in December 1915. The terrified family delivered it to Preston Manor, which is known for its paranormal occurrences and spiritual events. A medium visiting the house inspected the book and confirmed that they could sense evil omens emanating from its pages. It remains locked up only to be viewed after cleansed. Yeah, I don't think I'm going anywhere near this thing. Yeah, all those old books are usually wrapped in like someone's skin or something evil. Yeah. No thanks. And coming at the number one spot, The Iceman. This definitely had to be my number one spot. And it's not my favorite UFC fighter, Chuck Liddell. But this is the most terrifying find of all. Not really much of an item either, but 
more like a 5,000 year old frozen and perfectly preserved human mummy that was discovered in 1991 in the Otzel Apps in Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name researchers chose to name the mummy for obvious location reasons. This frozen mummy is of a man who believed to have lived 5,300 years ago. Otzi is believed to have been apparently murdered before being frozen in its time. This is claimed after the discovery of an arrowhead found embedded in his left shoulder and various other wounds on his body. He also has multiple different DNA types on his clothes, suggesting he was in combat or in danger in his last moments. The nature of his life and the circumstances of his death need more investigation, but scientists believe he's Europe's oldest natural known human mummy, offering a very shiny new view of the Copper Age. A huge glacier surrounded him after he died of exposure and preserved his body in a mile high ice cube. However, this is where it really gets spooky. Once unearthed, rumors of a curse surfaced too and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die, often in accidents or natural health problems. All in all, so far seven deaths have been tied or loosely related to Aussie's dethawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi the Iceman, a mountaineer who died in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman on a hike with his wife and later perished after falling down a treacherous path, a molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home after he was finalizing a book about Otzi, the head of the forensic team died of a heart attack, another discoverer died of a brain tumor, and another researcher perished of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses if you believe them or not, when people start dropping all involved in this one find, there's got to be some sort of otherworldly connection going on here. Whatever the case may be, this find is one of the most scientifically precious and also one of the most spiritually terrifying. Should we study this mummy some more and unearth more mysteries of the past, or should we risk the lives of those who study it? Starting off this countdown, we have Mary Todd Lincoln's dress. This beautiful dress was once owned by Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife. It's a beautiful purple velvet dress with satin and lace detailing. She wore this dress during the Washington winter social season in 1861-62. to But here's the thing. After her husband's death, Mary went into mourning for a long period of time. In fact, she stayed in widow's clothes up until her own death in 1882. So she had no use for this dress anymore. So she gave this dress and some of her other items to her family members. This dress was given to her cousin Elizabeth Todd Grimsley. In 1916, Grimsley's son sold the dress to the Smithsonian's First Lady's Collection. And now, apparently, it's haunted by Mary Todd herself. People have heard weeping when they have been near this dress. On a number of occasions, they have actually seen Mary Todd Lincoln's apparition by the dress. Thankfully, she means no harm. But if you think about it, it's quite sad. Even in the afterlife, she's still mourning over the loss of her husband. Hopefully, she can eventually find peace and reunite with him. Moving on to number four, we have the Smithsonian. One of the most haunted items in the Smithsonian is the museum itself. It is haunted by a number of ghosts. As a result, they actually offer ghost tours on location for people interested in the paranormal. On a number of occasions, workers have seen past Smithsonian scientists who would work on the collections there. But the most active ghost is that of the Smithsonian's first curator and second secretary, Spencer Fullerton Bard. Almost all of the night guards at the Smithsonian have seen his ghost wandering the halls. They see him gliding through the halls, people try to talk to him, and then he disappears into thin air. Then you have the ghost of Secretary Joseph Henry that also likes to show his face around town. According to the night guards, they said, and I quote, Henry is often seen fully clothed in the garments he wore in life, walking through the exhibits before returning to his post. His post being the statue the museum has in place for him. Dude, what in the night of the museum is this? Seriously. Then you have the countless unidentified entities that also haunt the halls. These are just like black shadowy figures people have seen in passing. At least it seems like these ghosts mean no harm. Like sure it's kind of spooky, but at least they aren't malicious. Also, hit that thumbs up button if you want to see me go ghost hunting at the Smithsonian. I'm down. I'm down. Number 3. The Delphi Sapphire the Delphi Sapphire is a seemingly beautiful gem that carries with it a dark legacy. It's also known as the Gem of Sorrow, named for the misfortune it brings upon all those who owned it. Its first owner was a British cavalryman named Colonel Ferris, who stole the gem from a sacred temple in India in the 18th century. Soon after returning to England, he was plagued with financial destitution, bringing his family to the brink of collapse. Shortly after this, his family all started to develop debilitating diseases. Ferris suspected that the gem was responsible for these wrongdoings, and attempted to pass it off to a family friend who fell 
gravely ill immediately after taking it in. Shortly after Ferris' friend passed, the gem was bought by Edward Heron Allen, a scientist who similarly experienced his life falling apart after acquiring the gem. In a desperate attempt to free himself of the curse, Edward threw the gem into Regent's Canal, thinking that he'd freed himself of the accursed stone. Sadly, much like the one true ring, this gem wasn't going to stay at the bottom of a river. It was fished out of the canal and quickly sold to a local jeweler, who recognized the stone as one he had mounted onto a ring for a client, one Edward Heron Allen. Thinking he was doing Edward a favor, the jeweler crafted a new ring and returned it to Edward. Isn't that nice? From there on, Edward swiftly tried to rid himself of it again, this time giving it off to a singer, who after a brief ownership, lost her voice entirely and never sang again. With the ring once again in his possession, Edward decided to end the vicious cycle of re-gifting and lock the sapphire away. He locked it in seven stacked boxes, surrounded by good luck charms, and gave it to his bank to store in their vault until his passing. Never to be opened, never to be sold. Heron even advised the bank that after his passing, it should be kept for another 33 years, just in case there was any residual curse smell in the box, I guess. Anyway, eventually, the sapphire found its way to a museum, as these things always do, who upon opening the seven boxes, found inside a letter reading, This sapphire is accursed, and stained with the blood and dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. Whoever opens this box, do with it what you wish. My advice, however, is to throw it into the sea. Number two, James Dean's car. Absolutely nothing is cooler than driving a souped up Porsche, and in the 1950s, there was no one cooler than James Dean. Aside from being the cultural face of 1950s teenage delusionment and an icon for outcasts of his day, James Dean had a passion for cars and racing, and had a collection of impeccable Porsches, although the last one he would ever own was a Porsche Spider 550. It was actually commissioned for Dean, and was one of the first makes of that car produced. A souped up Porsche capable of race speeds, it seemed like the perfect car for a hot-headed rebel. But from the moment he got it, people were wary. A friend of Dean's, actor Alec Guinness, wrote in his diary after meeting James with the car that the sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry. I found myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize, please never get in that car. You will be found dead. Normally any friend telling you outright not to get into a car would be worth paying attention to, but I feel like special triple warning should be heeded if it was Obi-Wan Kenobi telling me not to do it. Sure enough, Dean ignored, went ahead and raced the car anyway, leading to a tragic car accident that would claim the actor's life. Shortly thereafter, the spider was chopped for parts, where its engine was bought by Dr. William Eskrick and installed in his own car. The suspension and transmission of the spider was given to Eskrick's colleague and fellow doctor and racing enthusiast, Troy McHenry. In a race in 1956, both doctors Doctors driving cars with the Porsche's old parts both crashed, leading to the death of McHenry and injuring Eskirk. Somehow, not learning any lessons, the self-proclaimed king of customs, George Barris, purchased the mangled wreck of the 550, hoping to rebuild it as a tourist attraction, where it was sold to the National Safety Council as a harrowing display of road safety. In 1959, while in storage, the car spontaneously caught flame. The tires were sold to a private buyer who had them burst on the road, causing them to careen off. And finally, in 1960, while in transit from Miami, the car disappeared entirely. The whereabouts of the car and its pieces are currently unknown, with the only confirmed part left being a transaxle that was found in Massachusetts. And finally, at our number one spot, the devil's rocking chair. When we think of a devil sitting atop a throne, our mind isn't likely to conjure up the image of a rocking chair. That's more for kindly old grandparents. But for the Glatzel family, it was all too real. Seemingly an unassuming piece of leisure furniture, this twisted piece of haunted mahogany became the focus of one of America's most notorious Glorious exorcisms. In the early 1980s, the young son of the Glatzel family, David Glatzel, claimed that he was being plagued by nightmares of a creature with jagged teeth, twisted horns, and hooves. And the family was worried, as the boy wasn't really the kind to make things up. The boy insisted that he would see this beast sitting in the chair, rocking, watching him, laughing, threatening to steal his soul away. You know, regular old imaginary friend stuff. The visions persisted and even manifested physically, with David waking up in the middle of the night with scratches, bruises, and cuts, as well as red marks around his neck, as if something had been grabbing his throat. He would convulse during the night and a family member would watch him sleep as he would have seizures repeatedly. David started to hiss and growl at his family, and even was reported to have spoken tongues, quoting from the Bible. Eventually it became too much for the family to bear, and professional help was brought in from, who else? Ed and Lorraine Warren, who performed multiple exorcisms and brought in a series of priests to try and quell the spirits inside the house. Lorraine asserts that she saw the chair levitate in her time there. After a final exorcism, it's reported that the demon left young David but found its way into his sister's fiance, one Arne Johnson. She reported the same growls, hissing, as well as 
was slipping into periodic trances he couldn't be shook from. Tragically, Arn was involved in a conflict that led to the death of his landlord, and when he stood trial for it, insisted that he hadn't acted on it, but rather it was the demon possessing him that made him do it. He was locked away. After these dark events, the chair was kept away in storage, for fear that its evils might seep into the rest of the world. It resides now in the haunted museum, owned by Zach Baggins himself, one of the world's foremost experts on the paranormal, and a sort of modern successor to the Warrens, who's indisputably the wisest man to be owning something like this. Let's just hope he's not looking to get comfortable in it anytime soon. Number 5 on this list is the British Museum. The British Museum has a super haunted item in it that is said to be somewhat responsible for the death of hundreds of individuals. The Unlucky Mummy. Museum Crush says, not actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin lid of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. The British Museum's Unlucky Mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mysterious mummy was found at Thebes in the late 1800s and tales of its curse start soon after that. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in shooting incidents and two died in poverty. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the mummy. One of the most astonishing rumors surrounding the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic with the loss of more than 1,500 lives. One of the victims on the Titanic was journalist William Thomas Steed, who was one of the first to pen articles about the mummy's curse. Survivors from the disaster recall Steed telling stories of the ominous artifact over dinner, and as the mummy's sinister reputation grew, people even began to believe that its presence on board caused the disaster. Now I will say this, there was no actual record of the mummy being on the Titanic. I mean think about it, if it was then how could it be in the museum right now? It would be at the bottom of the ocean. So we know that it was never actually there, but that didn't stop it from cursing the boat all the same. It's believed that Steed carried this curse onto the ship and that the telling of these stories are what ultimately cursed the ship to begin with. Almost as if bringing up the mummy multiple times in a row unleashed its power. For my sake, I really hope that this isn't the case though. Pretty sure I've talked about this mummy a few times before on this channel, and if this is like a Beetlejuice thing, like say it so many times and then it happens, then I could be in for some trouble. Number four on this list is the Royal Museum's Greenwich. So apparently the Queen's House in the museum actually has a cursed piece of architecture built into it. Museum Crush says, rather a large object, the tulip staircase of the Queen's House of Royal Museum's Greenwich lays claim to being the first geometric self-supporting spiral stair in Britain and is rightly regarded as one of the great features of the former royal residence. But it is also the location of the Rev R. W. Hardy's famous ghost photograph. The retired Canadian vicar and his wife visited the house in 1966 and like many people before and since happily snapped away at the elegant spiral of stairs. But it wasn't until they returned to British Columbia and developed their films that they noticed a scarily cloaked spectral figure climbing the stairs. Subsequent investigations into both stairs and photograph have thrown no further light on the unearthly mystery, although as recently as 2002 a member of staff reported seeing a ghostly figure cross a balcony of the stairway before disappearing in time-honored ghostly fashion through a wall. I guess you could argue the stairs case isn't necessarily an item, but who cares? The museum is still as haunted as ever and maybe even more so. At least with other museums that have haunted or cursed items, the curse just pertains to that object. And usually if you don't touch the object or interact with it, you should be fine. Just walking around this place and especially going up or down the stairs carries a pretty heavy risk to it. Be very careful around the stairs at the Queen's house if you ever end up going. In our third spot today we have the ancient Egyptian treasures. Rumor has said that a number of treasures or artifacts from ancient Egypt are cursed. I mean, you all know about King Tut's curse. Well, there are a couple of items in the Smithsonian from ancient Egypt that are definitely haunted. For starters, we have the scarab. This scarab is believed to be from King Tut's tomb. For starters, it is believed that bad luck will fall on anyone who handles King Tut's body or other artifacts in his tomb. Everything in there is believed to be cursed by King Tut himself. I'm sure you've heard of the story of Howard Carter and his team that excavated the tomb. 
after doing so, several of the people involved died suddenly and mysteriously. So it's believed that this scarab is cursed along with the other items there. And then we have the mummified cat head. Yeah, you heard me. Now this one actually isn't from King Tut's tomb, but a woman named Mab B. Nylon donated a cat's head. Yeah, just the head. Who knows where the body is? Hey, maybe she kept it for herself and it's on display in her house. I'm not gonna judge. Anyways, this creepy thing is a preserved mummified cat's head wrapped in linen. Inside contains a real cat skull. Well, according to a number of workers, they have seen a ghostly cat apparition move around this display. This damn ghost cat is probably out looking for the rest of its body. This cat has also been seen wandering the halls and in several other exhibits as well. Moving on at number two, we have the Black Aggie. This all started back in the 1800s when a woman named Marianne Hooper Adams, known by her friends as Clover, sunk into a terrible depression. As a result, she drank some of her photography developing chemicals and took her own life. After her death, her husband commissioned a sculptor to make a memorial statue of her. It was named the Adams Memorial, and later Black Aggie. But because of how it looked, people called it grief. And that's when this creepy legend surrounding it was born. Legend goes that if you stare into her eyes long enough, they'll open up and start glowing red. Those that see her eyes will either be killed by her or she will cause you to go blind. Not only that, if you sit on the statue's lap at midnight, then you will die within two weeks. It's also said that pregnant ladies should never go near her. If they do, she will cause them to miscarry. Of course, this is just a creepy legend, right? Well, supposedly there's real life stories of this haunted statue taking people's lives. One man put a cigarette out on the statue's hand and he was later found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. Another man was found dead at the foot of the statue and no one knows his cause of death. Now you may be wondering how the statue got to the Smithsonian. Well, because of the legend, a lot of people were breaking into the cemetery at night to visit it, and it was often vandalized. So the family donated it to the museum where it remains to this day. And in our number one spot today, we have the Hope Diamond. This is a very beautiful diamond from India. But here's the thing, it was stolen from India, and then a curse was placed on it. Back in 1792, the Hope Diamond was part of a Hindu statue. It was one of the idol's eyes. And then somebody went in and took the 115 carat diamond out. Upon discovering that the diamond was stolen, priests put a curse on it. The curse was said to affect anyone that put their greedy little paws on it, which turned out to be a lot of people over the years. And guess what? Bad luck befell to every single one of its own. Owners. It's said that the man who stole the diamond shortly came down with a raging fever and died shortly after. Legend continues on saying that his body was ravaged by wolves. Continuing on, King Louis XIV bought the stone and had it recut in 1673. He died of gangrene and all his legitimate kids died early on in life. Then we have Marie Antoinette, apparently she wore it as well. And we all know how bad things ended for her. Another story involved an heiress named Evelyn Walsh McLean. She bought the Hope Diamond and everyone around her started to die mysteriously. First it was her mother-in-law, then her son, then her husband left her and later died in a mental hospital, and then her daughter. She later sold the diamond to get rid of this curse. That's not even half the people affected by this diamond, like the list goes on and on. Now the haunted diamond is on display at the Smithsonian. Hopefully no one will ever try to steal it because we don't need to relive its curse over again.